looking thing that is. That's one of your very first uh, unmanned air uh, systems. The, uh, it's a drone. It uh, carried a camera, and uh, it was used back in 1944. Of the proposed budget for 2017-2018, uh, um, today's April 28th, we do have a quorum. Uh, today we'll be considering Economic and Workforce Development Department, Housing and Community Investment Department, uh, Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority, Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles, the Planning Department, and Building and Safety. I apologize, I misspoke at the end of the day yesterday and said that we'd be considering Department of Transportation. That will be uh, on Monday. Um, as I've mentioned in previous days, we will be taking public comment uh, on the budget every single day. Um, so although this is a single meeting that stretches out over many days, uh, it's only one meeting, but we will be taking public comment each and every day. But we will only be taking comment that pertains to this proposed budget, the 2017-2018 budget. We won't be taking general public comment about is issues that are unrelated to uh, this budget. And um, on the subject of public comment, I have what looks to be over 100 cards already, uh, speaker cards. So um, I will try to get through as many of these as we can, uh, but we will uh, be cutting comment off after about an hour because um, otherwise we won't be able to do any of our consideration of the work today. So what I would ask is if someone has already made your point um, and you don't need to speak for your full minute or you don't need to speak at all, um, it will allow more people to have an opportunity to speak in that hour uh, if, um, if we try to be as abbreviated as we can, um, particularly because I think many people will be speaking on some of the same topics. And uh, I will tell you right now, for those of you who I think many of you are here to talk, for example, about uh, LA Rise, and I think <coughs> you will find that there will be strong support on this committee for uh, considering funding uh, for LA Rise, which is not included in this budget. And in fact, uh, I'll be asking for a, a report back on that to identify funding to be able to, to fund LA Rise uh, in this budget. So um, that's by way of example. If you're here to ask us to do that, trust that we will be doing that. So uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, start our speakers. We can only allow one minute per speaker. And we'll begin with uh, Eve Sheedy, followed by Geraldine Stapleton, followed by Nancy Volpert, followed by Sharuni Padabanda. And I would ask that you go ahead and line up and be ready to go. Good okay. afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk quickly. I'm Eve Sheedy, chair of the city's domestic violence task force. 20 years ago, you, the city council, created the task force and at that time included $5 million to fund domestic violence services. That has never happened and now 20 years later, our funding continues to shrink year after year. The mayor's budget includes $1,222,000 for DV shelter operations. This will be added to $1,075,000 of CDBG funds and we remain at two, under $2.3 million. That leaves us at $13 per bed per day, which is one third of the $30 rate used by LASA, even though 20% of our city's homeless population are victims of DV. We're asking for an increase of $2 million for DVSO funding and a million dollars for prevention. That would bring us up to $23 per day, still le less than the going rate. Um, we recognize, we're, oh, did it pretty well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, our next speaker is Geraldine Stapleton, uh, followed by Nancy Volpert, followed by Chiruni Padibanda. Yeah, Geraldine Stapleton, president of California now. And as a, a DV victim myself, the first thing I know is that you become homeless when you're freeing for safety. Uh, transitional dollars are not included in the mayor's budget. And the belief is that DBTH will be funded by Major H, but that's not a guarantee. So we urge the City Council to restore DBTH that has been cut or eliminated. It's not reasonable for the city to assume that the county should backfill these reductions with non-city major, major H dollars. Eliminating this funding means that someone can be housed in an emergency shelter for 30 days and then will be homeless because there will be nowhere they can go. So please put in the funding. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next speaker is Nancy Vol Volpert, followed by Shurundi Padabanda, followed by Tim McOsker. Good afternoon. I'm Nancy Volpert, Director of Public Policy and Strategic Initiatives at Jewish Family Service of Los Angeles. Uh, one of many of the DV providers who are here today asking you to increase your investment in services in funding for shelter and non-shelter services as we try to address the growing homeless population. As Eve mentioned, 20% of the homeless are survivors of domestic violence. Two-thirds of the women who are homeless are survivors of domestic violence. As we increase DART, we increase visibility, we need to also fund the increase in services for the survivors who do choose to seek help. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Shiruni Parabanda, followed by Tim McOsker, followed by uh, Marcelo Vavala. Good afternoon, council members. Chairani Patibanda on behalf of California Hotel and Lodging Association. We'd like to draw your attention to some of the assumptions that affect revenue forecasting regarding transient occupancy tax. Apparently, because there is no historical, historical financial data, the TOT collected under the Airbnb agreement is patterned after the hotel industry. Instead, we believe that assumptions that model the policy that is currently being deb debated in the council right now should have been made. We also ask why no one has studied whether the drop in hotel TOT is correlated at all to the increase in illegal commercial units advertised on Airbnb every day. The Airbnb collection agreement does not legalize this activity, which is currently prohibited. This is evidenced by the protracted policy debate that is occurring in the council right now. You as policymakers are trying to appropriately balance many competing interests, including affordable housing and the housing stock, and illegitimate revenue should not be one of those things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tim McOsker, followed by Marcelo Vavala, followed by Stephanie Richard. Good afternoon, Chairman and members. Thanks very much. I just want to add to what Char said regarding the transient occupancy tax. As you know all better than I, uh, that sometimes budget decisions will appear to or actually drive, um, and sometimes budget decisions will appear to or actually drive policy decisions. And I know you are practiced in being careful about that. What you have in your budget document is a carryover of the, of the agreement, the voluntary agreement to pay in lieu of transient occupancy tax monies from the Airbnb, the Airbnb STR industry. And I think it would be fair for you, and it's reasonable that it's, that it's put in there because it's a placeholder. In fact, it's money that did come in, but I think it would be fair for you to take a look at that number, ask for it to be analyzed, have it come back, and make sure that what goes into the budget leaves for you the policy decisions that you're going to make about protecting neighborhoods, protecting jobs, um, and making sure our housing stock is not debilitated by um, the Airbnb and the STR industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marcelo Vavala, followed by Stephanie Richard, followed by Guadalupe Garcia. Good afternoon, Honorable Paul Krikorian and members of the Budget and Finance Committee. Marcelo Vavala with the Los Angeles Conservancy. We urge the committee to support the Department of City Planning's budget request, which is also being supported by Council Members Rue and Caretz. The amount requested is a minuscule percentage of the overall proposed city budget, yet will bring a significant return on a relatively minor investment. The benefits of HPOZs in preserving neighborhood character are undeniable. With funding provided, the city's HPOZ program can serve the immense needs and continue providing responsive services to more than 35 historic neighborhoods across the city. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephanie Richard. I did get your last name right. Yes. I hope. Okay, Stephanie Richard, followed by Guadalupe Garcia, followed by Maria Dominguez. I'm the Policy and Legal Services Director at the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking. I'm here to tell you that human trafficking services are homeless prevention services. Under the federal definition, labor and sex trafficking victims are considered homeless. Traffickers often threaten human trafficking victims with being homeless to force them to work in commercial sex or labor. They also use it a way as securing lo loyalty to victims so they feel complicit in their own crimes. Across the country, it is well understood that housing is one of the greatest unmet needs of trafficking survivors. We need specialized shelter programs as well as transitional housing. No human trafficking specific money is in the mayor's budget. And also the, the impact of the domestic violence money impacts trafficking victims because that right now is where the majority of our victims receive services. So we're asking for $2 million to start 
two very comprehensive specialized housing programs in LA for human trafficking victims. Thank you. Our next speaker is Guadalupe Garcia, followed by Maria Dominguez, followed by Reverend uh, Oliver Bowie. Good afternoon, my name is Guadalupe Garcia. I'm the Delivered Program Manager at the DEPSCA. First, I want to thank Mayor Garcetti for including on his budget funds for the delivered centers. This is very important, especially due to the national political environment that we are in. The laborers are one of the most vulnerable community, and the city should ensure that the labor centers will be kept open. The labor centers represent a great resource and support for the laborers in the community at large. I would like to request the Budget and Financial Committee approve funds for the labor centers, and if it's possible, increase the amount that will be allocated for them, since the need is much bigger than before. The resources and services as legal support job trainings, referrals, fighting wage theft, have to increase due to the political situation that affects many people in the community. Our budget is less than one million, and we serve thousands of people through the seven deliver centers in Los Angeles. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next spe speaker is Maria Dominguez, followed by Reverend, er I'm sorry, Reverend Oliver Bowie, followed by Allison Messenger. Good afternoon, I am Maria Dominguez and I work at Hotel Irwin in Venice. We're a small family owned hotel and provide 125 jobs with health insurance and benefits. As you know, there are more than 1,500 illegal STR units very close to our hotel. Venice is a ground zero for short term rentals and this has significantly hurt our business. Our room rentals are, have gone down, our revenue is down, and as a result, our share of TOT remittance to the city is down. We fear that jobs may soon be jeopardized because of the continuation of illegal STRs in our neighborhood. Hotels are taxed at a higher rate than home sharers. It is critical that we think long term. We need to support our hotels as they create stable, good paying jobs and remit a higher percentage of TLT to the city. You are robbing Peter to pay Paul and creating a precedent for bad policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is Reverend Bowie here? Okay. Uh, our next speaker is Allison Messenger, followed by Jerry Jones, followed by Bob Amano. Good afternoon, committee members. I'm here on behalf of Genesee Center, which is the one of the oldest and largest domestic violence intervention programs in South Los Angeles, and one of the largest providers of housing in South Los Angeles with a 23-bed emergency shelter and a 74-bed transitional living program. I want to uh, ask the committee to support the DV task force request for increased funding for DV services in the amount of $2 million and specifically to allocate funding for transitional housing. We know that between emergency shelter and permanent housing there is a critical need for bridge housing, commonly known as transitional housing, which affords victims and survivors of trauma time and opportunity to heal from the effects of trauma, including time to address the medical and also the mental health effects of complex trauma, as well as to augment their life skills, their education and vocational skills. As we like to say at Genesee, it takes time to get ready. And thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jerry Jones, followed by Bob Amano, followed by Veronica Perez. Hi, I'm Jerry Jones with the Inner City Law Center. I, I was heartened by your comments about LA Rise. I also want to uh, uh, voice my support for the uh, uh, restoring the budget cut to the domestic violence program. There are a number of deep cuts in the mayor's budget to existing line items. Uh, I think the assumption is that the county of Los Angeles is going to backfill these cuts with Measure H. That's not a reasonable approach for the city of LA and the city should not be stepping back uh, as the county is stepping up. We need uh, funding for these line items that were uh, put into last year's budget and um, the, the county budget, as I think this committee knows, is going to likely be finalized after the city budget. So what essentially is being proposed is leaving homeless folks in the city um, in a lurch with the hope that the county puts back money the city is cutting. That's not reasonable. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bob Amano, followed by Veronica Perez, followed by Julie Sinai. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Uh, Bob Amano representing the Hotel Association of Los Angeles. Uh, previous speakers whom we are in uh, uh, standing next to our hotels, uh, our, our labor, and also our affordable housing um, community pro um, members. Um, what our deep concern is, is that uh, in particular line item re as related to the uh, in the budget related to transient occupancy tax collection uh, from short-term rentals. Uh, it's an increase of 22 percent. Well, we're only f projecting that the hotels are going to contribute a 5 percent increase. So there's a very big dilemma there. That's our very big concern. All I'm saying is uh, take a look at it more sensibly. Let's analyze the numbers and make sure you're actually making a, a, uh, the right decision in how that budget uh, pans out. So on behalf of the Hotel Association Los Angeles, uh, I ask you for your support in re-looking at uh, budget. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Veronica Perez. Veronica Perez representing Keep Neighborhoods First, 4,000 Angelinos, over 4,000, supporting true home sharing and opposing the commercialization of our neighborhoods. When the city entered into a tax agreement with Airbnb with no public process, we expressed concern that the regulations being drafted would lose steam, the co that collecting revenue from illegal home rentals would take priority over crafting good policy. With the release of this draft budget, our fears have been realized. While other great cities such as San Francisco, New York, New Orleans and Santa Monica have passed regulations to protect their housing, jobs, and neighborhoods. LA is two years into the process with still no regulations and no enforcement. We are dismayed to see that this draft budget projects revenue based on the continuation of illegal activity. It purports to tie your hands as you are working to create good policy. We ask you to delete projections for revenue from illegal activity. We ask you to send a message to LA's workers and residents that our neighborhoods are not for sale. The policy should dictate the revenue projections, not the other way around. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and as uh, Ms. Sinai is coming forward, uh, I have the following, I have a, a group of cards. Um, Ms. Sinai, Michael uh, Graf Wisner, Francis uh, Jatendik, uh, Victoria Evans, and uh, Jackie Koch, all of whom are speaking about LA Rise. Mm -hmm. Please keep in mind, I've already asked uh, for a report back to support LA Rise uh, in this budget, but um, you're welcome to speak, but please know that we're, we're already moving forward on that in the committee. So uh, go right ahead. Great, thank you. My name is Julie Sinai, and I'm the Vice President of Policy and Regional Partnerships for Red F. And I appreciate your comments and your inquiry. I just want to make a quick clarification. Red F um, has been working very closely in partnership with the city, and LA Rise has already provided 770 transitional job opportunities and have transitioned 140 into competitive employment. We wanted to clarify that the funding that is currently represented in the budget is for the Workforce Innovation Fund grant that basically funds the 500 individuals of that 770 for retention services. That funding doesn't allow for any new enrollment into LA RISE. With an additional $2 million reallocation, we'd be able to serve an additional 275 to 300 folks to get into jobs. We'd be able to continue the partnership around working with housing and look at really the transition into competitive, self-sufficient employment. So we appreciate your inquiry, and we really would like to continue to support the program. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and you know, for that matter, everybody here who's uh, here to support LA Rise, if you could please just stand for a second. You're standing in, okay, thank you. All right, very good. Now, come on ahead. The, the names that I mentioned, you're, you're free to comment as well. I'm not gonna tell you you can't. Just uh, keep in mind we're moving forward on this. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Graf Weisner, and in the spirit of your uh, recommendation to pass time, I will, I'll- Thank you very much. Uh, Francis Jatandik, followed by Victoria Evans followed by Jackie Koch, followed by Don Garza. Hi, my name's Francis Standike, and i just let you know, Chris is a, an LA Rice program has given me the confidence to better my life and my position in life. Without the LA Rice program, and especially Chris is Lafla, in Lafla, I wouldn't be where today where I am today. Thank you for supporting the LA Rice program and giving us a chance to contribute to our community. I ask you to, uh, to please, Continue funding for the LA Rice program so individuals like me can have access to immediate services and transitional jobs and long-term employment. Thank you very Thank much, you. sir. Hi. Hi. My name is Victoria Evans. I am a 61-year-old 
Two years ago, I lost my job and, and due to health reasons, and I became homeless. I felt hopeless because there was no benefits or resources for me. Through the Downtown Women's Center, I was able to access programs such as LA Rise. In 2016, I joined LA Rise working at the Made, w at the Made by w DWC Social Enterprise of the Downtown Women's Center. I received services through the LA Rise Partnership like job training, skills, life skills, and just recently unemployed, I mean employment. Thank you for your support of LA Rise and for the, giving me a chance to constructively contribute to my community. Please continue to fund the LA Rise program so individuals like myself can have access to immediate services, transitional jobs. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, our next speaker is Jackie Koch, followed by Don Garza, followed by Eliza, Elisa Kuykendall. Hi, I'm a people operation manager for an employer called Managed by Q, and we actually employ individuals through the LA Rise program. Um, so I'm grateful to hear that it is moving forward. Um, I just want to say that it helps us so much with helping to provide on-the-job training and cover some transportation costs. Um, we are a technology startup, so we're still trying to become profitable and make it, and um, it's very helpful, and it's been wonderful for us, for employees. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Don Garza, followed by Alyssa Kuykendall, followed by Tom Grody. Uh, my name is Don, and I live downtown Los, Los Angeles on 5th and Main. What I would like to see in the budget included, and maybe you are already there, but I would like to see more grants for outreach, for specifically for some of our bids downtown. I know that the downtown center bid has been doing a lot of outreach through with PATH outreach workers, and I've, they've been miraculous. So I would like to see, don't, and please don't supplant any of the um, the things that are already in the budget for issues such as homelessness just because Triple H is going to start throwing money in there because we need, we need as much money and funding as we can do. But I would love to see a lot of these bids get some sort of grant funding for outreach because they're, they're right there locally. They're right outside their doors, the people that need the outreach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Alyssa Kuykendall, followed by Tom Grody, followed by Shamaya Manriquez. Hi, thank Hi. you all for your work on the budget. My name is Elissa Kuykendall. I'm a volunteer leader with an organization called Secure Personal Access. We've been making progress on a pilot location for an innovative stationary hygiene center. And we're working quickly on this with broad city, county, and community support. Just last month, the capital for the project was to be funded, or until last month, the capital was to be funded by the 2016 Navigation Center budget, and we needed this funding. Last month, this $2.1 million 2016 budget was moved to sanitation. As a result, we have already delayed beginning a series of community engagement meeting and other work. Although HHH could handle some similar facility capital needs, without any funding in the 2017 budget, this project will experience further unintended delays. A toilet audit we completed earlier this year in Skid Row confirmed the deep need for additional public hygiene. The data show this lack of toilets is a health and dignity crisis. Because of the city's response last year, we were able to act in the 2017 budget. I ask that you address this need with urgency. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Our next speaker is Tom Grody, followed by Shamaya Manriquez, followed by uh, Alexander uh, Laurent. Uh, hi, my name is Tom Grody. I'm a Skid Row resident, and I just want to piggyback um, on what Alyssa just said, that uh, we were moving forward. I mean, we're still going to move forward, except now we have no money. <laughs> but somehow we'll find a way to move forward. But we were moving forward based on the money that was in the budget for the Navigation Center, which has been pulled out to our distress and uh, taken towards the uh, Department of Sanitation. This was the 26, 2016 money. So as a Skid Row resident, one of the things we were going to fund was a very innovative outreach strategy to Skid Row. Um, and I would encourage you to support an innovative outreach strategy to Skid Row unless you like people yelling at you. Uh, thank you. The next speaker is Shamaya Manriquez, followed by Alexander Laurent, followed by Reba Stevens. Hi, my name is Shamaya, and I am a homeless advocate, and I'm also someone who is in support of 
the ongoing funding of Measure H for services. I believe in Measure H because I am someone whose life has been saved because of services specifically. So please consider those whose lives are directly affected by the services that are provided. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Alexander Laurent, followed by Reba Stevens, followed by Ann Miskey. Um, good afternoon, members of the council. Uh, I'm concerned that the city's budget for homeless services is based heavily on physical facilities and light on operational funding, leaving most of the follow through to entities who are going to benefit from the funding provided by Prop Triple H. Um, while our local charities and nonprofits do countless good for the community, they cannot do the job alone. And I feel that in order to maximize the effectiveness of the funds set aside from Prop H and Triple H, uh, the city needs to be an active participant in realizing the success of these new programs. I ask that the council consider including line items and budget allocations covering operational costs for new homeless services and facilities. The city should be an actively engaged participant in the uplifting of the homeless community and of Skid Row. Active engagement creates a sense of accountability and subsequently a sense of trust that the city and the community are in the effort together. Uh, while we as citizens of the community need to extend our helping hand to our fellow citizens, I would hope that the city's hand would be outreached right next to ours. I hope to see a budget that holds the city accountable and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Reva Stevens, followed by Ann Miskey, followed by uh, Tulin Smiley. Good afternoon, Councilman. LA City is reducing its investments. My name is Reba Stevens and I am a formerly homeless person. LA City is reducing its investments and its homeless services by almost half, 42%. That's a cut of $30 million down from $71.8 million in its current year to $41.4 million next year. Proposition HHH is for construction, explicitly not for services, and should not be counted as part of LA City's investments in homeless services. LA City is proposing to replace its current funding with $29.2 million in Measure H funds. Isn't what LA City proposing directly contrary to what the voters thought they were approving? New money for homelessness in LA County. Let the, let's be honest about what new investments really mean. Now is the time not to step back at a crucial time that the voters are strongly urging for you to continue your joint effort. And I'm going to leave the rest of it with you because it's important that it is submitted. Please. Thank you. Please do. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Ann Miskey, followed by Tulin Smiley, followed by Ileana Tavera. Good afternoon. My name is Ann Miskey, the Chief Executive Officer of the Downtown Women's Center. Thanks to your leadership and dedication, Los Angeles is one of the first and only cities in this country that recognizes women experiencing homelessness as a unique population with their own service needs. The majority of the women we serve are victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, human trafficking, child abuse, and other forms of violence. These women require unique services that are facing drastic cuts from the initial proposed budget for the coming fiscal year. Last year, we saw specific line items in the Los Angeles budget directed towards women, and this has moved us forward. The critical services that we need to continue are women-only shelter beds, coordinated case management, and as has already been stated, job workforce programs that will directly affect the women that we serve. We understand that resources that will soon be available through Measure H. However, depleting city funds, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tulin Smiley, followed by Ileana Tavera, followed by Vivian Lee. Hello, my name is Tulin Smiley, and I am director at Center for the Pacific Asian Family. We have been providing emergency and transitional shelter and comprehensive support services for victims of domestic violence for the past four decades. Every year, each of the transitional programs serving city residents runs the risk of losing having their HUD uh, dollars reallocated. For CPAF, such reallocation would mean a loss of approximately 41 of our transitional shelter beds. Our newly acquired transitional shelter currently houses six victims and 21 children. If we were to lose that funding, where would these families go? Domestic violence victims experience extremely high levels of trauma. We applaud the Council's desire to expand and provide innovative solutions to the homelessness issue, but we caution against doing so at the expense of existing programs that, and services that are working for domestic violence victims. 
Um, to sign a rental agreement, complete a job application, or enroll in school would require that a victim has a certain level of proficiency in English. Providing them with housing but without helping them navigate normal everyday challenges means domestic violence victims will not thrive even if they get access to housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ileana Tavera, followed by Vivian Lee, followed by Chanel Smith. I'm Vivian Lee with Little Tokyo Service Center. We have a transitional housing program for DV survivors serving the ethnic specific groups, mainly the Asian Pacific Islander immigrant population. We started this program in 2003 as we see the need to have this transitional housing options available to the survivors. Reduction in funding for transitional program means survivors stay in emergency shelter longer as there is no place to send them. This means less availability for those who are actually fleeing the crisis situation. The survivors need time to heal. They need to wait for uh, the legal paper to learn new language and skills. There is no one size fit all programs to the DV population who experience so much trauma. Please include funding for transitional housing to give survivors a choice, another option for them to move towards a violence-free life. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chanel Smith, followed by Elizabeth. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, from Rainbow Services, followed by Keith Nakata, followed by Stephen Luftman. Hi, my name is Chanel Smith. I'm the Residential Programs Manager at Sojourn, a project of the People Concern. We're one of the largest service providers to homeless population and DV survivors. Our DV transitional shelter provides a place for DV survivors where they can gain necessary skills to stay safe, safe from their abusers and heal from the trauma of the abuse inflicted on them. That cannot be gained in 30 days allotted at a crisis shelter. We are asking that the mayor's budget include funding for transitional housing. Transitional dollars are not included in the mayor's budget and the belief is that DV transitional housing will be funded by Measure H. There's absolutely no guarantee that this will ever happen. We urge the city council to restore DV transitional housing that has been cut or eliminated. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth, is it Estival? Eastland. Eastland. Eastland, oh, that's sorry much for easier my than writing. I thought. I'm sorry. No, that, <laughs> now, that you, now that you pointed out, it's obvious to me. Okay. <laughs> okay, Elizabeth now you, you know my name, Eastland. so I could eliminate that one. Good afternoon, followed council members. Followed by Keith members. Nakata, followed by Stephen Luffman. Uh -huh. I'm the e executive director of Rainbow Services and the vice chair of the city's domestic violence task force. And today I'm focused on the elimination of funding for DV programs for singles and families and the mayor's proposed homeless budget. I'm asking that this line item be completely restored. Um, the city assumes that Measure H funding will offset this line item, and LASA is going to request that we continue funding of these programs, which I fully support, until Measure H funding is allocated. While I remain hopeful, there's no guarantee that this will happen within the time frame to support the families that are served at Rainbow. A year ago, I spoke before this committee in support of this line item. I was proud to be living in a city that recognized the needs of these very critical services as other communities across the country were eliminating funding for transitional housing for domestic violence specific survivors. Los Angeles took a stand and supported the ongoing funds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Keith Nakata, followed by Stephen Luftman, followed by Amaris Galindo. Hi, good afternoon. Keith Nakata. I'm the uh, Planning and Land Use Co-Chair at the Mid-City West Community Council making personal comments today regarding funding the positions in the Planning Department's Office of Historic Resources HPOZ program. We currently have three HPOZs in our area, including one of the newest, the Miracle Mile HPOZ. Recently, Survey, Survey LA has completed its groundbreaking work, so now is the time for the communities to identify future H HPOZs to preserve the character and history of our communities for a sustainable and living, livable city. Please fund these critical positions that so directly uh, impact the citizens of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephen <coughs> Luffman, followed by Amaris Galindo, followed by uh, Antoine Washington. 
Hi, Stephen Luftman. Um, I also urge you to support the city's planning department's uh, request for funding for HPOZ staff. 396000 is a small price to pay for something that affects so many people's lives. Historic preservation creates a vibrant, sustainable, livable city. Uh, preservation preserves the diversity of our neighborhoods, especially in this time of, of gentrification, and it helps prevent the loss of rent-controlled housing. Once again, I ask you to support this request. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amaris Galindo, followed by Antoine Washington, followed by Emily Martinez. Hello, council members. My name is Amaris Galindo, and I am a program coordinator at 1736 Family Crisis Center. We're one of the largest agencies in Los Angeles serving homeless, a population including domestic violence victims and human trafficking victims. I'm here today with my colleagues to urge you to consider the importance of keeping subpopulations of homelessness in mind by protecting both emergency and transitional housing options. Such victims, such as domestic violence victims, no longer have a home because this is where a place where murder can and often will occur, so they flee, becoming officially homeless per HUD's definition. However, homeless, homelessness by definition does not meet the special, specialized needs of domestic violence victims, nor adhere to best practices in the field by providing safety, confidentiality, and long-term shelter needs. The need for transitional shelter care is paramount for many DV families, because when they come to us for shelter, they are beaten, battered, and severely traumatized. We cannot ethically rush them into rapid rehousing every case, as they will be forced out of emergency shelters and possibly back to their batters. Thank you very much. Is Anquan Washington here? No. Okay, our next speaker is Emily Martinez, followed by Bridget Kelly, followed by uh, Tayara Viscara. Good afternoon. My name's Emily Martinick. Oh, sorry. Do, uh, it's okay. June the 3rd, 2011, I officially became homeless because I suffered from bipolar disorder. After I became homeless, I was soon admitted to Olive View Hospital on a 72-hour hold. That turned into a six-week stay. That stay and that hold was passed on to the taxpayers. I was then placed at LA Family Housing, where I lived for nine months. I had to comply with doctor's appointments, keeping, taking good tenancy classes. In short nine months, I received a brand new studio apartment in Sun Valley, California in District 6. And completely furnished, I mean with linens, cleaning supplies, everything. All I had to do was walk over to Ralph's and buy some food. Last year, I suffered a financial setback because of supportive services. I was able to maintain my apartment and my sanity. And today, I've been given the opportunity to advocate for others. Thank you very much, and thank you, Ms. Martinez. Thank you very much, Ma. <laughs> Our next speaker is Bridget Kelly, followed by Tayar Viscara, followed by Tamara Case. Good afternoon. My name is Bridget Kelly, and I work on public policy at PATH. We greatly appreciate the city's willingness to make extremely important one-time investments during the last fiscal year. Through the city's rapid rehousing portion of this investment, PATH has already helped 110 people move into permanent housing throughout the city of LA, from the west side to Metro LA to the Harbor Gateway area. We have hundreds more in the process of making it home. Our outreach teams collaborate with the city when encampment cleanups occur. We recognize the, com the community's concerns, but th without investment in long-term solutions and resources to get our homeless neighbors into permanent housing, the encampment cleanups are ineffective. The passage of Measure H represents extremely important mom momentum towards ending homelessness, and LASA plays an integral role in ensuring that momentum continues. However, measure, if Measure H is used as an opportunity to offset city funding reduction, Measure H's impact will be limited and not nearly as powerful as anticipated. We, as service providers, need the city's committed partnership to ensure Measure H is as effective as it can be. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tayar Viscara, followed by Tamara Case, followed by Cheyenne Phoenix. Come on up. Hi, I'm Tamara Case. Good day, Council. Thank you for your time. Please acknowledge we are indigenous stolen land. 500 years of colonization has taken place. Oppression, poverty, poor living conditions, relocation, traumatizing indigenous people for 500 years. 
Please also note the military occupations, five branches, Morton County Police, BIA, National Guard, private security, FBI, protecting corporations and oil interests against unarmed peaceful water protectors at Standing Rock. Okay. Consider your moral and ethical responsibility for the people and Mother Earth hold, and generations time, to come. Hold your time, please. Implement hold, the green sustainable. I'm sorry, ma'am. 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 I'm sorry, we're going to speak about the budget. Anything else is going to be ruled out of order and disruptive of the meeting. I'm sorry. So if you wish to speak today, it's going to have to be about the budget for 2017-2018. Nothing else, please. Come on up. I said, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your time and allowing me to speak. My name is Cheyenne Phoenix. I come from the Navajo and Northern Paiute Nations. I stand here today on occupied Tonga land. I stand here today as a um, person who benefits from the Numu or Paiute Mr. people. Mr. Chairman, the, the speaker is not the Paiute speaking people, for the And let, let, let I am her, here to talk to about the, the unethical banking practices that you okay. yeah, that's practice not, with that's Wells not, Fargo. That's not on our so agenda, ma'am. Stop your time, it, please. Sorry. We're not going to talk. No, no, you're not. No, you're not. Because we're not talking about that today. That will be agendized in a regular meeting, not today. Thank you. Your time is done. Thank you. Your time is done. You're disrupting the meeting. Our next speaker is Mark Valli Vallianatos, followed by Frank Romero. Sorry, we have a budget to consider. That's what we're doing today. Thank you. You're disrupting the meeting. You'll need to have a seat or you'll be removed. Mark Valianatos, followed by Frank Romero, please. No, your time has expired. Mark Valianatos, followed by Frank Romero, followed by Francisco Cerna. Come on up, please. Hi, I'm Mark Valianatos, and I'm here representing Abundant Housing LA, which is a pro housing volunteer group in Los Angeles. We support more housing of all types. We especially support housing for the homeless and services to help them get into homes and stay there. And so I'd echo some of the statements that are said that we, we supported H and HHH, and we think voters did by overwhelming margins because we believe that it'd be adding new money to services and to homes, not replacing existing city funds. Um, you probably heard this, the statement that a city's values are judged not by its proclamations or its laws, but by its budget. And so we'd encourage you to put the funding back in for homeless services so we can meet this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Frank Romero, followed by Francisco Serna, followed by Allison Messenger. Hello, Council. My name is Frank Romero. I'm a staff member at United Way for Greater Los Angeles, and I'm also a resident of Highland Park. Uh, I'm here today to uh, uh, come before the Budget and Finance Committee uh, to have them reconsider some of the cuts that are going into the Homeless Services budget. Uh, uh, the, the money, the amount is up to $28 million, up to $34 million in cuts. I'm asking directly if, if, if $10.5, $10.6 million could be reconsidered uh, just because of matches, uh, matches that are on the table from the county and the federal government that we need to unlock in funds. Also, uh, breaking this, the, the, uh, some of this is um, uh, kind of breaking the partnership with the county in terms of what the city can do. The uh, county is there. But if we don't do that, I think the constituents are, are, are there's going to be an inability to meet the constituents' needs in this. Uh, noticing in the budget that there's about 10.6 million that's going to be invested in sanitation. Looking at that, it kind of reflects an old approach of can we sweep our way out of this? This is, this is not a part of a solution, but we need to address something that's more long term. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Francisco Serna. Uh, we already heard from Allison Messenger, uh, who will be followed by, so Francisco Serna followed by Jack Humphreyville. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Francisco Cerna. I am a resident of City Terrace and speaking as a concerned citizen today. Um, just last year, on the same day that I was at a community meeting and heard the staggering number of 45,000 at the time um, homeless in Los Angeles, I was that night at a Dodger game and realized with the attendance about 45,000, looking around and, and seeing that uh, the, no, the notion that that many people leaving that stadium and having um, essentially nowhere to go or access, or little or no access to essential services was staggering to me, which is why I volunteered to help with the campaigns for Triple H and, and Measure H. Um, fortunately, the passing of those measures represents significant steps forward in the solu solution to homeless problems and uh, issues in, San Diego, in, uh, in Los Angeles. But 
um, this proposed budget and the $34 million uh, cut from this budget for homeless services represents a significant step back. I'm asking that, um, as a native Angelino who's concerned with the appearance and development of our city, um, certainly, I'm asking that some of the um, uh, uh, funds that are being allocated towards sanitation and sweeps are uh, reallocated back to homeless services. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jack Humphreyville, followed by uh, Rebea uh, Sen, Sen, I think, uh, followed by Petronilla Banderas. Uh, my name is Jack Humphreyville. I'm a neighborhood council budget advocate. I was very disappointed in yesterday's meeting, especially with regards to street services. Not once did you discuss the efficiency of that department, which was panned by Ron Galpern in his, in his August four, uh, 2014 uh, audit. I was also disappointed that the City Council has not considered a comprehensive street repair plan despite adequate revenues from the local return revenues from Measure M and SB1. There are also revenues from other Metro uh, local, return, local return functions from Prop A, Prop C, and Measure M, all of which will total about $250 million next year and about $23 billion over the next, 20, next 40 years. Rather, we have a discussion about the repair of our failed streets versus the Vision Zero. I urge you to get, get, your, get your act together and develop a comprehensive plan for our streets. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rebea Sen, uh, followed by Petronilla Banderas. Good afternoon. My name is Sandra Bonneville. This is actually my customer, Petronina Banderas. She speaks Spanish. Um, would you guys like us to translate or? Uh, yes, that would be great. Thank you. And go ahead and put uh, the time on the clock for translation as well. Buenas tardes. Mediante la presente, me dirijo a ustedes con el propósito de hacer una importante petición. Deseamos seguir teniendo el servicio de la consejera Lorena Cortés en Family Resource Centers. Sabemos que quieren hacer recortes al servicio que ella ofrece y de forma inmediata afectaría a nuestros hijos, pues ella ofrece su consejería y yo como madre me preocupa el hecho de que se retire este servicio por parte de la señorita Cortés, ya que es sumamente necesario para nuestra comunidad su servicio y asesoría. Nos ayuda y nos motiva a que estemos involucrados en, el, en los logros académicos de nuestros hijos, además de que nos brinda un ambiente de confianza cuando requiere hacer Requiere que nosotros conoz conozcamos lo que el distrito escolar ofrece. También explica los requerimientos que los estudiantes deben de tener dependiendo su grado. Nuestra familia, en nuestra familia ha sido un honor ser parte del Family Soul Center, porque la señorita Thank Cortés, así como otros. Thank you, ma'am. So introducing, um, I'm seeking today uh, for the purpose of making an important request. We would like to request that we continue to having PSA counselors like Lorena Cortez at our family source centers. We know that budget cuts may end the services that she offers and it will immediately affect our children and parents who receive counseling at our centers. The services and advice help motivate parents to be more involved in the academic achievement of our children as well as providing us with an atmosphere of trust when one needs to know what the school district offers. She also explains the requirements that students should have depending on their grade level, grade level. For our family, it has been an honor to be members of the Family Source Center, and Ms. Cortez has been part of the staff who supports us in the education of our children, with workshops that she has offered to students as well as parents. It is very, uh, it's a very particular way. She is such an important element that we would not like for her to no longer be at our center. We know that you have the power to make changes, and we hope that we keep the PSAs at our Family Source Centers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Officer William uh, Etu, followed by Stephanie Vasquez, followed by um, Lorraine Cortez. Good afternoon, Chairman and uh, committee members. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the uh, Los Angeles School Police Department in regards to the uh, Los Angeles uh, Family Source Centers and our involvement with the Los Angeles School Police Department Arrest Aversion Program. The Los Angeles School Police Department Arrest Aversion Program um, was initiated in 2014 
utilizing a non-punitive enforcement model that supports strategic problem-solving models rather than citation and a risk-driven enforcement. <clears throat> it encompasses uh, those juveniles who commit minor violations of the law between the ages of 13 to 17 years of age. Um, it also includes the Los Angeles School Police Department, pupil services, and student discipline. Um, since the program's inception in 2014, uh, we have issued, or there's been 1,064 juveniles that have attended the program, with only 8.3% of those being forwarded to the Los Angeles County Department of Probation. Um, since the beginning of the Rest Aversion Program, we've only had 6.6% uh, of those um, uh, recidivize. So thank you very, very much. Appreciate thank, it. thank you very much. Our next speaker is Stephanie Vasquez, followed by Lorraine Cortez. My name is Stephanie Vasquez. I'm a pupil services and attendance counselor with Los Angeles Unified School District. I'm co-located at Youth Policy Institute Hollywood Family Source Center. Through the Family Source Partnership Program, we are working to break down silos. Collaboratively, we are creating educational programs for students and their families. We are offering a safe place for our students to go to after school hours and the opportunity to connect students um, with an adult support staff. Through our collaborative efforts, we are identifying resources that can help, can help students and their families under one roof. We are creating connections and aligning our resources. I would like to thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lorraine Cortez, followed by Ventura Florencio, followed by Maria Maya. Followed by Alan Martinez. Whoever comes to the mic first, go ahead and start. Doesn't need to be in order. Good morning, my name is Ventura Florencio. I'm here with my mother, Maria Mendez, to speak about the importance of having a PSA counselor at Family Source Centers. We have been receiving services at TCMP, a, low, a great low income organization since September 2016. For me, I started attending tutoring at CCMP to get academic assistance and to learn more about college and become a better person in school. Throughout this, we introduced, we were introduced to Lorena Cortez. She has gave me advantage on the A3, A3G requirements. She has helped me know what classes give me credit and what classes I need to pass. She has gave me help at school that school didn't give me. For example, I has, she has hosted two workshops about college and high school the A3, the A3G requirements, they were great because one of them had, we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation as for well. She helped my mom, who is an immigrant that didn't receive any education. She didn't know how to read and write, and she was that one person that explained her everything. Yes, thank you thank for your you time. For, thank you very much. Our, our next speaker is Lorraine Cortez, followed by Maria Amaya, followed by Alan Martinez, followed by Lydia Cervantes. Good afternoon, my name is Alejandra. I'm a case manager at CCMP and will be um, speaking on behalf of Maria Maya who had to leave back to school. Uh, so this is her speech. Good afternoon, my name is Maria Maya and I am a sophomore at Miguel Contreras. Today I came to talk to you on why Ms. Lorraine Cortez, the PSA counselor at CCMP, should keep her job. Ms. Lorraine has helped not only me but other students. Ms. Lorraine has helped me develop my leadership skills by creating workshops that have helped me develop my voice and be more comfortable speaking in front of many people. Ms. Lorraine also helps us students academically. She has talked to us one-on-one -on -one to determine how to help us go to college. She has taught me that if you put your mind on something and work hard for it, the outcomes you hoped for will happen. Not only has she helped us academically, but also with personal matters. She is someone that is always checking up on us and asking if there is any problems. Ms. Lorraine is always open to listen and give us advice to get us through the tough times. So I am requesting for you to not take. Oh. Thank you. Thanks. Can you tell? Can, I'm sorry. Can you tell me your name again, please? Uh, Alejandra Aceves. I was speaking for Maria Maya. Right. I just need to make a note of it. Alejandra. Aceves. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is uh, Lorraine Cortez, followed by Alan Martinez, followed by Lydia Cervantes. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Wendy Chavez and representing on behalf of CCMP, I'm an academic coach and I am I'm sorry, reading. I'm sorry, I didn't call your name. Did you fill out no, a No, it's for Alan Martinez. I'm, calling, I'm talking on behalf of him because he had to go back to school. So I'm going to read his letter. Okay. Okay, go ahead. 
Good afternoon. I'm a student from Miguel Contreras, ALC. I'm a sophomore and my name is Alan Martinez. Ms. Lorraine Cortez should be able to stay and help out future kids in CCMP as a PSA counselor. During my ninth and 10th grade year, CCMP and Ms. Cortez have contributed to my learning of leadership skills. She helped me discover my personal qualities such as my strong characteristics and my weak ones in which I can improve on in her five week program. She not only helped me in developing my leadership skills but also in my academics. She would do presentation of the requirements to go to four year college and explain the A through G requirements and why they are so important. She also made me keep up with my grades and keeps me motivated, which makes me do better at school. Finally, she has been a counselor therapist, talking with my family about my personal issues and struggles. She also had one-to-one -one meetings with the students on their objectives and concern of their emotional status. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lorena Cortez, followed by Lydia Cervantes, followed by Fausta Campos. Lorena Cortez had a lead. I'm sorry? Lorraine Cortez okay. is not here. Okay, so can I ask uh, Lydia Cervantes or Fausta Campos to come up? Are they here? No? Okay. Uh, Elsie Rosado, followed by Jacqueline Olivo, followed by Adriana de la Torre. Good afternoon. I'm here to uh, read a uh, letter on behalf of board member Zimmer from LA Unified. I write you today in strong continued support for the collaboration between LAUSD and the City of Los Angeles through the Family Source Centers. More specifically, I write to advocate for funding the full 16 Family Source Centers under the present model that is so well serving for families in need throughout the city. While I, while I recognize that it's never easy to push for funding beyond the CDBG allo allocation, this is one of those instances where the partnership defines the working relationship between LAUSD, the City of Los Angeles, LA School Police, and community providers. Discontinuing this level of support will set us back literally a decade in our ability to serve our neighborhoods in the most need. I urge you and the committee to recommend full funding of the partnership at 1.3 million to the 16 family source centers under this model to ensure that all 16 family centers are equipped with an LAUSD pupil services and attendance counselor. Since 2012, this partnership with the City of LA has served many of our families. Thank you. And you're uh, Ms. Rosado? Yes, and Elsie you're Rosado. And you're speaking on behalf of school board uh, member Steve Zimmer. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Jacqueline Olivo, followed by Adriana de la Torre, followed by Raul Estrada. Good afternoon, Chairman Kirkeran and members of the committee. The Family Resource Partnership Program is a collaborative effort between our USD and the City of Los Angeles Housing and Community Investment Department, which was established in 2014. The partnership program serves students primarily between the ages of 5 and 17. Pupil services and attendance counselors are co-located at 13 family resource centers throughout the city of LA. Since 2014, over 8,000 assessments have been conducted. PSA counselors also provide parent and student engagement workshops and classes at the Family Source Centers. Up to date, over 212 workshops have been conducted this year. PSA counselors serve as the main provider for the Los Angeles School Police Department Diversion Program, an alternative to citations for students who commit minor infractions. The partnership allows for a seamless continuum of services for families and students where individuals can receive support in one setting without being sent back and forth to different places. The district is committed to the partnership and hope that this committee will reconsider full funding to allow LAUSD support for all 16 centers. Thank you. And I'm sorry, tell me your name again. Jacqueline Olivo. Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker is Adriana de la Torre, followed by Raul Estrada, followed by Liz Herrera. <clears throat> Hi, good afternoon. My name is Adriana de la Torre. I'm a PSA counselor, and I work for the Family Source Partnership Program, and I'm at the Family Source Center in Pacoima. I'm not only a PSA counselor, but I'm also a community member of Pacoima. So working there, I've been able to work with families, been able to connect them to services. And I'm not only speaking on my behalf, but on behalf of my other colleagues that were there to help families with workshops, helping them understand the school system, and not only helping them understand the school system, but helping them empower to be more advocates for their own children. Um, I urge you to please fund all 16 with PSA counselors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Raul Estrada, followed by Liz Herrera, followed by Christina Marquez. Good afternoon, committee members. 
Uh, my name is Raul Estrada. I'm here on behalf of the Family Source Center Collaborative. I'd like to also acknowledge all of my fellow executive directors uh, and uh, leaders of the Family Source Centers. We are here in support of the City of Los Angeles uh, Community and Economic Development Investment request for $1.3 million to continue with the important, the all-important uh, partnership between the Family Source Center and LAUSD. We cannot say any better than these young men and these students and these parents that have come up, and I, th I think they deserve a round of applause for taking the time to come up here. The academic assessments and the psychosocial assessments and the services that are provided by our, by our PSA counselors are imperative to the success, to the continued success of the Family Source Center, which, as you know, is the top performing uh, system in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Our next speaker is Liz Herrera, followed by Christina Marquez, followed by uh, Rosa Aldaco. Good afternoon. I'm the executive director of Arnido Family Centers, and we have the privilege of operating two family source centers, one in Pacoima and the new Southwest FSC. And we have a unique perspective on the value of the Family Source Center LAUSD partnership because our Pacoima Family Source Center has a PSA counselor co-located with us, and our Southwest FSC does not. And quite frankly, it's been quite disheartening to see that our families in the Southwest, our youth, do not have the benefit of the academic support that our Pacoima youth have. And it, quite frankly, I think is having an impact on their ability to be able to, to get into the right academic school program for them and to really be able to make the kind of strides that we're seeing in Pacoima as a result of this really, I think, you know, really wonderful partnership between the FSCs and LAUSD. PSA, so I really do ask you to consider full support uh, requested by the Housing and Community Investment Department. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speakers uh, will be Rosa Aldaco and Cristina Marquez, followed by Alejandra Aceves. So Cristina will be saying it in Spanish and then I'll be translating. Great. Thank you. Buenas tardes, muchas gracias por la oportunidad. Uh, yo soy madre de familia y estoy aquí para pedirle eh, que los fondos para la, la colaboración del Distrito Escolar de Los Ángeles y el Family Source Center sigan apoyando, uh, de no reducirlos, ya que es una combinación espectacular para los padres de familia contar con estos recursos. Um, en mi experiencia personal, uh, mis hijos han ido en un aumento muy, muy significativo en sus uh, calificaciones y siento un gran apoyo de poder acudir uh, en el momento en el que yo necesite, tanto como mamá o como mis hijos necesiten la ayuda de estos dos recursos combinados. Y de antemano, muchísimas gracias por considerarlo y ojalá que esto tenga, tenga futuro y para adelante. Muchas gracias. I'm going to try to translate. Um, she, Cristina Marquez is one of the participants at um, El Nido Family Source Center in the city of Pacoima. And she is a mother of two who um, was referred to us by our PSA counselor in, in collaboration with the schools in the area. And she is here in support of the collaboration between LAUSD and the Family Source Centers um, in request to fund the 16 Family Source Centers across the city of LA for full funding. So all of them have the benefit of receiving these wonderful uh, benefits together. In her own personal experience, she has seen the growth of her children at academically, not only at the center, but also at the schools with the support that these two great partnerships are offering. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Alejandra Aceves, followed by Wendy Chavez, followed by Sandra Bonneville. Excuse me, Council. I'm, I'm Reverend Oliver E. Bowie from Holman United Methodist Church, and I had stepped out when you called my name, and I'm requesting the courtesy to of be able course. to make a comment. Of course, that's fine, Reverend. Sorry about Thank that. Thank you so much, Council, for your kindness. Um, I stand here before you as one who has worked hard on HHH and uh, Measure H in L.A. County, and I'd like to say I had championed the Council for putting forth such an effort behind HHH. But I say a cut to homelessness or any funding to homelessness is a step in the wrong direction. I hope that we really reconsider those cuts 
and look, how, look and see where can we find funding to continue to move forward and maintain the momentum that we had gained behind HHH. These are human beings and lives that are destroyed. It's not just simply, simply dollars and cents and understanding that the most priceless thing here on earth is human life. So please uh, find some way to replace that funding. Thank you so much for your kindness Thank and you, courtesy Reverend. and your hard work, and I hope that you find a way to work it out. Thank you, Reverend, very much. Our next speaker is Alejandra Aceves, followed by Wendy Chavez. Are they here? Okay. Uh, Sandra Bonneville, followed by Francisco Valenzuela. Are they here? Raise your hand. No. Yes. Trisha Bonilla, followed by Francisco Lopez. Francisca Lopez, sorry. Yes, hi, good afternoon, Council. My name is Francisco Valenzuela. I'm here with the uh, Barrio Action and the Family Source System, asking for your continued support of the LAUSD Collaborative and the PSAs being placed at the uh, Family Source Center sites. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Hi, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Tricia Bonilla. Y gracias a todos ustedes por el tiempo que nos da, han dado este día para expresar la preocupación que tenemos sobre el centro del barrio Acción. Um, la preocupación mía es de que uh, tengo mi hijo ahí, de, de, ya va a tener siete años de estar ahí en ese centro y, y los beneficios que él ha recibido han sido muy grandes. Y por eso estoy aquí para pedirles a ustedes de favor de que si puede seguir el presupuesto para que ellos continúen con los programas que siempre ellos han brindado a toda la comunidad, a, a mujeres como con consejería, a los niños que van con problemas de diferentes, con diferentes problemas. Y esa es mi, mi petición hacia ustedes de que por favor si pueden continuar el presupuesto para este centro que es el Barrio Acción. Gracias. If you don't mind, sir, sure. Go, go ahead. Translate. Mm -hmm. so yeah, my name please. is Tricia Bonilla. I'm here to support the family source system and the services that the PSA offers. Uh, my child has been going to the center and agency for seven years. Um, you know, continued support of services like counseling um, and the support that the center offers to the family. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, are you Francisca Lopez? Okay, come on up. And then our next speaker will be uh, Leah Renee Memsick, it looks like. Okay. Mi nombre es Francisca López, vengo de Barrio Ashon y estoy muy agradecida por la ayuda que le han estado da dando a mis hijos. Tengo tres hijos con, con ahí y me, me han gustado, me encanta el, el programa que está ahí mis hijos. Soy madre soltera y, y van bien las calificaciones de mis hijos. Muchas gracias. Thank you, sir. You said, my name is Francisca Lopez. I am a single parent of three kids. I've been attending a Barrio Action Family Source Program. Um, appreciative of the services that they offer. Uh, my three kids. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leah Renee Memsick, followed by John Urquiza, followed by um, Aaron uh, Pray, Pray. I'm sorry, I can't make it out. Go ahead. Hi. The city budget, hi, my name is Leah. The city budget continues to be corruptly, fiscally deprived of public money with a scheme perpetrated by city and state officials and employees. One example can be seen at assessor ID number 4414-021025, also known as 16321 PCH. Although the 19-acre beachfront parcel was allegedly sold in 2005 for about $15 million with an encumbrance of a mobile home park and geological hazards, Public records reveal that government offices kept the earlier owner's 1961 tax basis of only $3 million for the 19-acre beachfront property. The owner since 2005 has never had to pay for reassessed fees since 2005. The city has also abdicated its duty to collect the required fees due on the now 2016-2017 enlargement of the subdivision with new walls, new grading, new infrastructure. So is the fraud on the county assessor, the courts, or the people of the city of LA? Other way, the deceptive, either way, the deceptive business practices deprive the budget of the money due. Thank you. Please uh, correct the problem thank fast. You. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Urquiza, followed by, and I think it may be Jim Prayan or Aaron. 
Oh, it's Eric Previn. Oh, I'm so sorry. This pen was skipping. Okay, go right ahead, sir. Uh, good afternoon. My name is John Ortekisa. I represent uh, Recycled Resources for the Homeless in Highland Park. We have a very innovative program that uh, started just as doing outreach into the neighborhood and the community in the Royal Seca where all our homeless population was living. In our, about two years ago, we started an overnight shelter, and this is our second year for an overnight shelter. This shift in money is going to hamper innovative projects like ours, and it's going to bring back that idea of homeless sweeps. So please do us a favor and keep the momentum going that we have from HHH and H. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Previn. I think your pen was running out of ink or something. Go right ahead. And, uh, that's uh, okay, sorry, sir. Mr. Previn, followed by uh, Mr. Spindler, followed by Mr. Herman. Uh, thank you. It is Eric Previn from CD2, and I appreciate the, en the enthusiasm, sir. Um, for starters, I think that uh, the mayor could, could hold off on the $170,000 increase to his budget. Uh, I was really uh, disappointed yesterday when uh, the MTA overtime contract came into focus and Charlie Beck was kind of shrugging that, well, we're going to have to put it on the credit card to get the... The people in Studio City uh, wanted the patrols that we've been promised, and, and now... Uh, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. The jokes about that are not funny. The scattered sites idea is a great area in providing facilities and places for the homeless because then the burden against the nimbyism is spread out. But up in the HHH meeting that I wrote about in City Watch with my brother Joshua, they said we can't do that because it's too much work to do a small HHH construction as opposed to one that houses 50. Now, whereas I understand that, we're not going to solve our problem because we're going to run into all sorts of difficulties. So I would ask uh, that we find some way to make the audio links for these HHH meetings and for the, um, uh, both the civilian oversight and the administrative oversight available online regularly. Thank you, Mr. Llewellyn, for doing that. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Wayne Spindler, followed by Armando Herman. So where's the money? No money for toilets? That's because the Bureau of Sanitation had to give money to the Discovery Cube to funnel it to Kathy Blumenfield. And then yesterday, Nuri brings in Pacoima Beautiful. She's got to steal the money and give it to her nonprofit. So when you're all done, there's no money left. H, 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 I'm here to bitch, bitch, bitch that it's not being used for the homeless. It doesn't cost all this money. But these guys, you elect these people and they have to have the money funneled to the nonprofits, funneled to their spouses as salaries and gifts. So in the end, you got no goddamn money because it's all been stolen from the treasury of the city. Fuck you, stop stealing the money. Armando Herman. The purge against the violence, has it ended? No. But we have a homeless problem called HHH. -H -H. Bitch, bitch, bitch. Because you can't budget around 176 million fucking dollars to put homeless those with bipolar issues, those with mental health issues, off the goddamn street and into a home, a residential area where they can live and prosper with the quality of life. Bone in. So like the first gentleman speaker before me said, fuck you and your budget. Get back in the books and do something about it. This is, this is the so-called genocide. This is the Holocaust, you Jew boy and you Armenian. Fix the fucking You're budget. You're off topic. Your time Fix is up. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. You're disrupting the meeting. Ask Mr. Herman to leave, please. Out. Out. You're out. He's not coming back today. Uh, all right. Uh, members, I'd like to ask um, if there are any revisions in the memo list. Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to... Is my mic on? It, it takes a second. Go ahead. Mr. Chair, on um, report number... I'm Mr. sorry, Herman excuse me, Ms. Martinez, because Mr. Herman, as he is leaving the meeting, is still disrupting the meeting and delaying our getting uh, to the business at hand. Thank you. Goodbye. And I can still hear, hear his voice and the 
odd un sounds that he makes that no one seems to be able to understand as he's continuing to go out the door even now. So for the record, this is, you know, every day, every single day, the meeting of this committee as we consider the $9 billion budget of the city of Los Angeles is disrupted by these idiotic noises that Mr. Herman makes. And uh, we're not going to have it anymore. Mr. Bonin. Given that this meeting is not adjourning today, but is recessing, re, uh, recessing and reconvening on Monday, uh, cannot uh, Mr. Herman's expulsion from this meeting continue for the rest of this actual meeting, which continues next week? It, it is a point that has been made by some uh, that will be taken under advisement. Thank you. Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, under number 178, I liked um, the report, the budget memo to come back to this committee and not to the Budget and Finance Committee, the budget memo. Can it come back to our committee hearing? Because you referred it back to Budget and Finance Committee. I'd like it to come back before we adjourn our work here in this committee. Wh which memo is that? I'm sorry. 178. Oh, okay. You send it uh, back yeah, to the sure. regular Budget and Finance Committee. Sure, sure. So, um, in other words, f we'll go ahead and change that to a budget impa impact study that will be taken up for consideration before we adjourn this. Yes, meeting. thank you. Okay. Uh, any other revisions? Mr. Blumenfield? I yeah, just wanted to um, add yesterday, Mr. Corian discussed the San Fernando groundwater aquifer remediation during the sanitation presentation. And I, I want to add a special study report back from sanitation working on this issue using the treatments that were mentioned in Council File 140338-S1, uh, which, is, which is pending, which is something I've been working on. Uh, okay, so you want so that referred back here as a special study? Uh, yes. Memo? Okay, very good. Anything else, Mr. Bonin? Uh, a very small thing under uh, Board of Public Works, item number 165. Um, it says report on potential funding sources for a new measure and program manager. Just it should be projects manager. Oh, very good. 165? 165. Okay, anything else? All right, with uh, those revisions, um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the list. Moved by Mr. Bonin, seconded by Ms. Martinez. Sorry, there was one more thing, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, okay. Apologize. On uh, item number one, is this on 143, uh, it says report on potential savings from investing in mobile field based reporting uh, and potential re resources to fund it. That's the report back. Okay, very good. And with that, uh, I assume that's acceptable to both of you. So the matter's been moved and seconded. Any objection? Uh, the list as amended is approved. All right, that will bring up then our first department, the Economic and Workforce Development Department. Ms. Perry, welcome. So we have received your letter. I thank you for submitting that in advance. Uh, uh, everyone has had a chance to review it, but please feel free to open up and we'll dive right in. Great. Before I open up, I'd like to have the individuals I have with me just introduce themselves so you know who's here with what subject matter expertise, starting with Mr. Hughes. Samuel Hughes, Economic Workforce Development. Uh, Anthony Sanchez with the uh, administrative uh, section, the, the uh, budget section of the department. Michael Chi, Administrative Services Division, uh, Budget Director. Herr Rodo Workforce Development Director. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and to the members of the committee for allowing us the opportunity to discuss the 2017-28 proposed budget for the Economic and Workforce Development Department. And we are grateful for what we perceive to be, for the most part, level funding that is significant, and we appreciate the continued support. I'm going to just highlight a few things that uh, were listed in uh, my letter to you but are worth mentioning on the public record. 
Uh, on our workforce development side, uh, side of the uh, department, we have the Higher LA's Youth, or some of you may know it as Summer Youth Employment, and uh, over the last year we provided 15,000 young people with an opportunity to develop workplace skills and receive financial literacy uh, training. Our uh, proposed budget uh, includes a request for general fund dollars to continue to support this program. These funds will continue to be leveraged with money from the Los Angeles County and from uh, private and uh, private sector donors and philanthropic organizations. And as I'm sure you can note, uh, we have been recommended to receive $2.3 million in general fund monies. This includes a $300,000 increase to cover the increase of uh, the minimum wage and maintain the same number of participants going forward. Uh, the department also is tasked with continuing four of its key functions that support people who uh, may, be, uh, may not be eligible for federal grants uh, with jobs and other support services. That includes the day laborer program at $750,000, cash for college, $49,000, uh, youth source program at $573,000, and higher LA, which is higher LA's youth at $285,000. This, our, our department provides these services through our relationships with our uh, Private, uh, public sector partners, our nonprofit agencies, and staff located at our youth source centers in Boyle Heights and in Watts. Our proposed budget request includes a uh, request for general fund dollars to continue to support uh, these programs to the tune of $1.7 million in, in continued general fund um, funding. Uh, I, I won't go into LA Rise since you've already uh, expressed what you intend to do with that. I heard you. So it's important. Everybody likes this program. We don't want to affect the lives of 275 people in an adverse way. This is a program that works. Uh, the next uh, item that I'd like to highlight is the Gang Injunction Curfew Settlement Program, which will provide funding uh, to establish and operate uh, program, uh, operated program through third party agencies. Uh, it was uh, established uh, by the city council in this current fiscal year and the department will continue the program for the duration of the period set by the uh, legislative body which is a total of four years. Our proposed budget request includes um, a request for general fund dollars. Uh, we were allocated 4.5 million in the current year by council motion and the motion provides for continued funding of 4.5 per year. And um, the next item is on our economic development activities. We have commenced our asset management program and intend to continue that function. Uh, we are responsible for acquisition and disposition of uh, city-owned properties for public benefit and economic, uh, economic development purposes. Um, we did receive partial funding in the current year in order to fill new positions, which we have done. Uh, and so we will need uh, full funding and uh, for 2017-2018. Uh, the mayor's proposed budget includes a request for full funding of the general fund dollars to support those activities, and we want that and hope that will continue. Um, we have done very well on filling our vacancies. Um, we've put, filled uh, 11 new positions. Uh, three of those, three in addition to the 11 are pending, and uh, we're still waiting to get a determination on one position, the Assistant Chief Grants Administrator, and whether or not we get a 1001B exemption or not. Uh, just some new highlights, uh, the citywide economic development strategy, the RFP was posted, we got a number of responses. We have raters working on rating them now and are headed towards a consensus meeting uh, sometime in the next, next week or, or so. Uh, another highlight is our rapid response. Uh, we had a very uh, strong and uh, vigorous response on the layoffs by American Apparel. Up to 3,500 individuals were laid off, and it's just a function that we perform. We were able to sign people up for unemployment. That was 420 people. Uh, we had 266 of those 400-some people sign up at our work source centers, and then we uh, organized and worked with uh, the network to get 25 employers to place these individuals in jobs ranging from uh, sewers uh, to food services to forklift drivers. Uh, so that people could continue to uh, have an income. So our budget reflects this department's efforts to maintain our current programs uh, from the previous year and also service the ones that we've been tasked to service, asset management, LA Rise homelessness, and the gang injunction curfew settlement. Those are the new ones for this year. Um, those are my comments, uh, very quick. 
and uh, if you have any questions. Great, thank you. I think you, you covered mo uh, most of my questions. You said that the um, citywide economic development strategy mm -hmm. uh, process should be completed within, the bidding process should be done within about a week, did I hear you say? No, that's the consensus where we, everybody does their, their, their the raters do their raters individually and then collectively they come better, come together to build consensus on, you know, whether they agree, disagree, why, why not. Um, and then they make a final recommendation. So when would we be expecting to well, let the Well, you should contract? expect that we would be able to make an award by May. By May. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, and you mentioned some of the positions that you filled. Mm -hmm. uh, in last year's budget, we included six positions plus contractual services for a million dollars for implementation of the job creation strategy. Have those positions been filled? Are those among those that have been filled? Uh, the one that we're having uh, challenges with, we've filled in uh, 11 management assistants and many of them have gone in the workforce development department. And I'll ask Mr. Hughes if he wants to make a comment too. Uh, the one that we're having a challenge with is we, uh, we need an exemption on the assistant chief grants administrator. That is the position that will uh, work on the small business commission uh, development um, and working on business source, those sorts of things. So we, we need to be able to fill that and uh, we're still awaiting word on whether or not we will get that exemption. Okay. Um, did you want to add anything to that? Okay, great. That's the only one still? still That's a right. major okay. one. It's an important one and it would okay. be under uh, Mr. Hughes. Okay. Um, and then just finally, just as a, oh, no, two things. Um, you mentioned American Apparel, mm -hmm. and obviously that was a, that was a loss uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the apparel industry downtown and a lot of workers. Um, when we have a big uh, exit of a manufacturer or any other significant employer like that, does your department or, or anyone else uh, within the city family conduct any kind of an exit interview with the management to determine some of the uh, reasons behind uh, their departure? Uh, no, I don't think we do, um, and I'll have Gerardo go a little deeper into that, but generally speaking, we get a notice from the state, uh, this is a warning notice is what, what it's called, that uh, uh, a company is about to engage in layoffs, and uh, he can talk to you about the details, how large, how small, and then we mobilize to focus exclusively on the employees and to provide them with uh, whatever wraparound services they need to be able to sustain and get reemployed. So, Gerardo, why don't you pick that up? Sure, and typically what we do once we receive it, well, anytime an employer is, is um, going to lay off uh, 50 or more employees, they're required to uh, issue what's called an, a war notice. Uh, once we do receive that notice, we work with the employers to provide services to impacted employees. Most of our services are focused around the employees and ensuring that a, a transition back into employment. Um, we do fund a layoff reversion program that's uh, in which we contract with the LA Economic Development Corporation to provide services to employees prior to the actual layoffs. And so through that contract, we do, you know, we, we do have information in terms of, you know, some of the causes for the dislocations or, or bankruptcies. I, and I appreciate that, and I'm familiar with the Warren Act. Um, I, I, I'm asking something slightly different. Maybe mm -hmm. it's just outside of, of your purview. Uh, but yeah, I think that's the problem, that it's not within our purview. Yeah. yeah. What, I'm, what I'm getting to is when we have a, a big company that moves, um, we always hear the sort of conventional wisdom that, well, they're moving because it's so hard to do business here. And sometimes that might be true. Sometimes it might be because of very specific reasons that it's hard for that employer to do business, which we could fix if we knew about it. Sometimes it's because of statewide regulations. Sometimes it's because it's cheaper to manufacture in China. And if we don't know why those businesses move, we can't take appropriate policy actions to correct the problem. And so I just want to get to a place where somebody in this city is doing that. And I don't know who the right person is. You may be able to be. achieve that as we move forward to create a, this small business commission that you want to create. That may be a, a place to start with that. Um, it could be through the business source centers once we get our uh, position uh, up and running. Um, and we could see whether or not that could fit within that job description. But the, the, the issue is, and we can work this out later, the issue is is that they have to know to call us and not call right. other offices because these kinds of complaints come in 
anywhere. They may come in through a mayor's office, a council office. They may come in through building and safety. I got a call the other day from somebody who had been talking to sanitation. Um, so, you know, we'd have to work that protocol out so they actually came and landed where you want them to land. Okay. Very good. Um, that's it for me. Mr. Bonin, are you, are you down there? There you are. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Bonin. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to ask about uh, LA Rise, but that's been taken care of, so I will be very, very quick, because uh, Ms. Martinez has asked me to be. Uh, and I'm just going to ask for a report back uh, that lays out the potential funding options uh, to cover costs for any necessary consultant work to be performed to uh, establish an EIFD in the Venice Beach area. Great. That'll be all. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Ms. Martinez? I would also be fast. Um, I actually just had a request for a report back. Um, I'd like to request um, that we have a longer term discussion on the analysis of the department's metrics, numbers of jobs created by the adult youth and economic development versus the investment of dollars to support and create these, uh, these opportunities. Okay. okay. That's all. Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions. On the LA Rise issue, and I'm, I'm thrilled that we're bringing it back to look at the funding uh, because it's something that we all support. But I want to, when you do the report back, to also look at um, as far as the tool shed of ways we can fill this stopgap measure or fill this gap, whether it's a stopgap or, or a permanent fill, uh, both in terms of funding that we can find to backfill uh, and also potentially using. Uh, city loan money. I mean, in the sense that part of the problem, as I understand it, is, is a gap in time from when the county is able to take over certain functions, not for all of it. Uh, and one of the things we can do as a city is we can, we can borrow money pretty cheaply within the, within the year. So as part of the stopgap measure to, <clears throat> excuse me, to look at funding, but also look at potential city loans for any, uh, any time that's missed between now and when the county takes over certain functions. Uh, so that's one. Uh, second issue having to do with the um, assistant grants administrator. The ad hoc jobs committee, which, which I'm a member of, passed the, the business plan in 2016, included the creation of a citywide economic development strategy, a small business advance team, small business commission. Uh, in particular, I want to ensure that, the Los, that Los Angeles is a strong competitor for grants dollars, just like we've talked a lot about. Uh, so positions like the assistant grants, chief grants administrator are particularly valuable for leveraging more dollars. Uh, have the, do we have enough money in the budget for this type of position and in order to allow you to leverage as, uh, maximize the grants that we're going to get? So a couple of things. As you probably already know, this department is nearly 80 to 85 percent grant funded and has been for many years so we have never lacked in knowing how to seek grant money as a matter of fact I think we have a lot of expertise among the staff and we have a, a, a resource development unit and that's all that individual does all day every day uh, the issue of getting an assistant chief grants administrator is not a matter of whether we have funding. It is a matter of whether or not we can get the 1001B exemption. So we need a determination as to whether or not we will get that exemption. And if we don't get that exemption, then we have to go through a civil service process, which is a very lengthy process, as you, I'm sure, know, and would probably drive us into November because we'd have to then have personnel post the position, certify the list, and that's why an exemption um, is a much more advantageous approach for us to take. Okay. Uh, lastly, on the CRA issue, something you and I have talked a lot about and been focused on, in fact, after the CRAs were eliminated through their unfortunate lawsuit and court case, uh, I did a bill in the legislature to try to make sure that at least with the excess bond money, that we would be able to capture that money here at the state, at the city, and that was about 92 million. And we're in the process, but it's a ticking time clock in terms of spending that money and taking down the five or ten properties citywide uh, that are part of that CRA wind down 
mm -hmm. uh, possibility. So not for right now, but I wanted to ask for a report back on um, where we are with the excess bond money. If there's, if there's anything else you need from us, I want to make sure that, that this committee and this city is providing all the, all, the, all the resources you need to leverage those dollars because we're not going to have a lot of opportunity to leverage that kind of money uh, for a long time. We don't want to miss, miss out on that. So just as a, as a report back. Sounds or good. if there's any comments you want to make toward it now. But. Uh, we just, Mr. Hughes is here. Uh, perhaps you'd like to make a comment. Later your request and make certain that that's part of the report back. Great. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah, and to just support us when you can to help us move these projects through so that we can get them done before the uh, options expire. Yeah. Well, well, I couldn't hear you. No, I, I, I uh, yeah. Jim um, Perry was initially referring to uh, the properties, but I think you were making reference to the excess yes, bond, bond proceeds, proceeds and making certain that those monies are, yeah, it, are it's effectively both. spent. It's both. What, what, whether we'll be able yeah. to take down all the properties, because we may not be able to get them all. The ones in, in my district I've been very focused on. But, and then the ones we get in the pipeline, just help us, help you, help us. Right. Okay. And, then, and then the excess bond money. Yeah. Um, you know, figuring out we're working hard on that in, in the, the 23 million in, in my area, but I just want to make sure we, we're giving you all the support you need to make sure we leverage all uh, throughout the city, the rest of that funding as well. Okay, thank you. All right, anything else, members? Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Perry. Thank you to your team. Uh, that will bring up next uh, HCID. Mr. Cervantes, welcome. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you for your thorough letter, and thank you for getting it in early. We've had a chance to look it over, but feel free to go ahead and open up, and we'll get right into it. Oh, great. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the Budget and Finance Committee. Uh, I am joined this afternoon by our Executive Officer, Laura Guglielmo, and Assistant General Managers, Abigail Marquez, Lou Santiago, and Roberto Aldape. Uh, I'll keep my comments brief. Uh, I want to thank, the, the, obviously, the mayor and the CEO's office for preparing a budget uh, when there's difficulty in balancing the budget, uh, limited general funds. Uh, when you take a, a quick look at our budget, it would look like it's a, very rosy because of an increase in funding and positions, but I just want to caveat that in that that's primarily to support uh, one new program that we're responsible for, Accessible Housing Program. Uh, that's uh, derived from a settlement agreement in which we have to ensure that 4,000 units are remediated or built to uh, accessible ability standards over the next 10 years. So beyond that, the, the budget is, uh, is standard. It, it meets the uh, level funding levels that uh, we had requested. Uh, within our letter, we uh, laid out a few items that we felt that were low-hanging fruit that potentially could help the department over the next several years, and I'll, like you said, you've read that. Uh, the department has its plate full, obviously, with homeless, homelessness as well as lack of affordable housing as we look to implement HHH, H, as well as the uh, accessible housing plan as we address the gentrification of the communities and expiring covenants, uh, as well as addressing uh, Ellis properties. So uh, with that, uh, we're here to answer any questions you may have regarding our budget. Terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, we will start with Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Cervantes, can you talk in more detail about the federal entitlement funding gap that you talked about in your letter? Um, has this been magnified um, because of the high volume of decrease in federal funding? Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, this is a structural issue that has faced the city for several years now, and it really doesn't matter which department administers the consolidated plan, which is the Emergency Solution Grant Dollars, HAPA, or Housing Opportunity for People's Aids, Community Development Block Grant Dollars, and Home Funds. Uh, those four fall underneath the CON plan, and for years when it was under CDD, it, it was very robust, and uh, to the latter part of their administration, when they were in, uh, uh, still in operation, um, they were running into deficits just because of the s increase in cap rates, the staffing levels, and the like. So uh, now fast forward several years, uh, HCID along with EWDD have similar problems in that you've got declining entitlements and of course corresponding with that uh, declining admin dollars. At the same time, the cost allocation plan uh, goes up every year. The cost allocation plan is derived from 
uh, creating or looking at the different uh, charges against a grant so that we can secure resources for general admin for the city. So as those cap rates go up, uh, entitlements go down, the workload between the two departments, HCID and EWDD in particular, uh, that, that suffers because we don't have the resources to uh, be able to fund all the positions that are needed to administer the programs. So we laid this out as just an FYI. This is more of a structural issue for uh, the departments that utilize uh, grant fund positions uh, under the CON plan. Because of the high cap rates, we think it's important to be able to look uh, at those rates and see what we're charging against these federal grants so to ensure that we've got a level playing field that at least the departments that are in charge with administering those programs have sufficient resources to be able to uh, fill staff, uh, fill positions to be able to uh, operate the programs. So uh, this was more of a note to file uh, for right now. I wouldn't expect immediate actions, obviously, because you're looking at a lot of, a lot of uh, major uh, budgetary decisions, but certainly, uh, as we go into uh, halfway through the year of the financial status report, I just wanted to put this out there, as, as, and I know that uh, Economic and Workforce Development Department had a similar problem uh, last fiscal year. I couple us together because it's, it's not just one department, it's a structural issue that I want to bring to your attention that we need to address long term. So can you talk a little bit about how your department is monitoring the federal grants and the problem associated to the administrative cost and the amount of staff that's actually needed to complete these tasks? Certainly. Um, we, we, uh, under the consolidated plan, we administer on behalf of the city uh, the four grants. Uh, three of the four are administered through this department, and then the fourth, uh, the portions of the dollars go to Economic and Workforce Development Department, as well as Department of Aging, as well as several others. Uh, a large portion of those dollars uh, are go through uh, neighborhood improvement grants uh, that are neighborhood improvement uh, projects for capital projects throughout the city. So we administer those as well, working with Public Works Department. Department. So there's a general over uh, administrative uh, section of the department that has to oversee that. They look at the consolidated plan. They review all of the uh, review. They review all of the projects to ensure that they meet national objective and they can be spent in a timely fashion. And then follow up on the back end uh, as far as uh, wage compliance and the like. So it's there's a, a lot of uh, backroom operations required to administer the, the consolidated plan on behalf of the city. And then on the service end, we have staff that support family source centers, domestic violence shelters, the social service piece. Uh, that's, that's complicated in the fact that we have limited resources for that as well. And if you look at, say, uh, the housing opportunity for people with AIDS program, that's a countywide program with, that's funded with, I think, four positions. So it's, it's, and then you get the emergency solution grant dollars. Those goes to LASA, and essentially we've got a 3% admin uh, portion for that. So there's limited dollars that we have to administer the programs. And as we move forward to uh, address homelessness, uh, homeless prevention, uh, these are critical services need to provide, and the, the workload hasn't gone down, notwithstanding the fact that the, necessarily the grant entitlements have gone down, but certainly the workload continues, and that's why we're, we're having a, a structural problem that we need to address longer term. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd like to get a report back on the potential cost of adding staff to the to HCIDs versus the potential realistic liabilities of letting these continue to operate without the current funding levels. Is that Okay. Uh, Councilwoman, if I could add, um, I think part of the challenge we have with the federal grants is that, as you probably know, they only allow a minimum for administrative cost, and that doesn't cover the cost of our staff. The other challenge that we're going to continue to have is that our grants are going to continue to go down. So even if the federal government doesn't make any cuts to the grants this year or next year, and even if the programs are not eliminated, just because of the city's data, the changing data in poverty and housing conditions, the grants are going to go down. So I think it's a bigger discussion that we need to have on how, how is it that we're going to support the programs, and maybe even the discussion of is there, are there programs that we need to change or modify or eliminate. I mean, it's, it's going to be a big challenge going forward. Okay, perhaps we can add that to the report back as well. Um, I also had another question regarding um, our HHH money. Wait, yes. If I, if I could just add one other thing to that same report, I think, uh, because we should have it all together. Let's also consider, you know, what would be the service impacts and what are the plan B options if we have a complete cutoff of federal funding for CDBG. Which you brought up yesterday. Which is, which is what the president proposed. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Gregorian. Um, in regards to HHH, are all the are all the monies in 
on, in HHH dedicated to new construction? Um, and are we picking up, are we tapping into the general fund for any administrative costs? Uh, at, this, uh, at this point, uh, first of all, it is new construction. Uh, recently, we were uh, able to get nine projects totaling approximately $75 million in bond uh, proceeds. Uh, that will fund 440 units of permanent sort of housing, uh, all told 615 units. Um, there is an administrative uh, portion that can be charged, and Ms. Brill can, from the CEO's office can speak to the specifics of that, but basically we are going to be able to charge uh, against the, the, uh, the bond okay. uh, for activities from the point of underwriting to the time that's placed in service. Uh, at a late, we have staffing requests in now that we've received approval for several positions, and there, uh, I believe there are five more that are in the queue for potential uh, determination. Uh, once these projects are placed in service, that will obviously put a burden on the back end, that is monitoring of those covenants and monitoring of uh, the loans. Uh, down the line, we'll evaluate uh, our workload uh, to determine what kind of uh, impact they may have uh, on the staffing because obviously they're monitoring anywhere from 40 to 42,000 covenants as well as over 5,000 loans as we, can, as we continue to add to those with HHA dollars. We'll have to find some alternate source monies potentially to pay for that staff. Mm -hmm. So are we initially front-loading that money that administrative to cover the administrative costs? Well, right now it would be covered administratively through admin dollars, uh, general fund dollars that will be reimbursed by the bond proceeds okay. once they're sold. And apparently, the, well, we should have the bond proceeds probably August, September time frame, uh, and that we should be able to start drawing against it. Did you want to add anything else? All right, you answered. Council Member, one comment. Um, the housing program, the first round, which you will be seeing next month um, before your council is all new program. The facilities program, it could, it has to be bricks and mortar, but it may ultimately be a mix of new and renovation to extend the life of, for example, a shelter or, so it's not all going to be new in the entire program. Mm -hmm. And actually on the housing portion as well, um, we could use it for new construction or, or rehab. I would also add that the funding that we can use for staffing is very limited under the bond program. So we are, um, what's going to come before you in a couple of weeks is a report that's also going to include uh, underwriting fee that we would charge the projects, but they could actually charge it as part of their, their overall project cost and request to Prop HHH to cover um, the staffing cost. Okay. Um, one of the things that um, I've been speaking to some of the human trafficking advocates about is the real crisis in, in finding shelter and housing for a lot of the victims that we end up either taking off the street or rescuing um, some of these human trafficking victims. So. I really want us to take a look at what we can do for this particular population. I want to report back on how we develop housing for victims of human trafficking using some of the Affordable Housing Trust money, Measure HHH, or other programs. Okay? And the last thing I wanted to add is um, I understand that you've also expressed interest in taking the lead on the next steps for exploring the feasibility of a child and child safety account program. And Mr. Rue. Uh, having spoken to him earlier today, he noted that he expected the cost to be anywhere between $150,000, um, but that's currently not listed as one of your line, your line items. So I was going to request a report back on whether we can find those funds and set them aside for that study as well. Okay. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfield? Well, Ms. Martinez asked most of the questions and the report back on the fundamental question which we have to deal with, how to deal with uh, this ever decreasing, potentially eliminated, eliminated source of federal funds is is going to be a big one. But uh, to to narrow cast a little bit, the the Family Source Center funding for the FSA counselors, um, if there are a certain amount of, uh, certain cuts to there, how do you determine which counselors to cut? And I'm particularly worried in you know Canoga Park, the Family Source Center is the only one in the West Valley. The entire valley is served only by three of 16 centers. Um, so it's crucial to keep them everywhere, but it's particularly crucial, mm -hmm. at least you know, from my lens, to keep the one going in Canoga Park. So I wanted to get a sense of, of how that determination is made if we actually have to come to that of eliminating FSA counselors. Well, right now, Councilman, 13 of the 16 family source centers have PSAs in them. Uh, the amount of money we requested would enable us to 
fill all 16 family source centers with PSAs and a little bit extra because last year we utilized some program savings to offset uh, the, the grant reduction and the rest was filled by general funds. Unfortunately, we don't have that rollover this year, so the ask is $583,000. Uh, I think $583,300 uh, is the grand total that would enable us to have 16 uh, PSAs in, in all 16 uh, family source centers. And to answer your question about uh, w which ones we decide not to, well, I will hope not to answer that question. Well, we certainly want to get a report back in terms of trying to find the funding that you're looking for. Um, but I also want to, to understand, and maybe that could be part of the report back of what the process would be if if you did have to make that decision. So which we, we would one. work. We would work with uh, LA Unified School District based on their data and determine which which schools uh, don't need as much assistance as some other schools based on on the performance of the children. Right. And like you, I, I hope it doesn't come to that. Yes. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I want to take a step back for a second. W one of um, the things that I have found in my district has worked well in ensuring affordability uh, more cost effectively even than building greenfield new affordable housing is extending existing affordability covenants. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess first I'd like to know, do you have or does someone in the city have a comprehensive list of the existing affordability covenants uh, that we have throughout the city and when their uh, scheduled expiration date would be so that we can consider a more comprehensive strategy for e extending them if rehabilitation of the aging buildings is necessary doing that mm -hmm. to ensure that existing affordable units don't become unaffordable while we're paying full freight for brand new affordable right. housing units. Yes, actually we do maintain that list and we uh, review it and update it on a monthly basis. Uh, currently we've got approximately 11,000 units uh, that are deemed at risk to convert to market rate over the next five years. And I would caution the, the 11,000 sounds tremendous, but about 70 to 75% of those are project-based Section 8 vouchers wherein they typically will renew on an annual basis, sometimes on a five-year basis. Last year, uh, we created a special group of two individuals that are dedicated solely to target uh, these projects to do extensive outreach to the property owners. First the letter, then following up with phone calls. They are literally soliciting these property owners to find out what their intentions are uh, so that we get to a point where when they have a, they have a year left to, uh, bef before they actually have to make their intentions known, uh, to the tenants that they intend to take their housing off the off the market, uh, we should know well in advance of that, and we've been successful so far. So since uh, 2016, we've been able to save uh, 16 properties and about 800 units and preserve those units. Uh, during that same course, uh, uh, the same time frame, we only lost about 400 units. So we've been getting ahead of this. Uh, either financial or non-financial. We try to negotiate as best we can with them to extend the covenants if they're mission-driven. We obviously like to be able to position them uh, to extend their covenants and or extend the, the, uh, their vouchers, second eight vouchers, not for a year-to-year -year contract, but to extend to a 20-year contract. So it's been very successful on that front. We work with the, uh, the tenants to ensure that they know what their rights are as well as landlords in advance. So uh, just in a very short period of time, Councilman, this has be become a very successful program to address this on the front end so that we're not surprised in the back end and we've got, oh my goodness, we've got six months to go and we don't know what we're going to do. So we have, we'll have known already in advance um, two, three years out what their intentions are. And there's different categories of type of uh, covenants. Uh, the one that we were targeting first were former redevelopment agency covenants where there was no uh, cash in them. They were basically purchased for uh, covenants in a market rate housing unit. Uh, we found that when we tried to reach out to them and negotiate extension of their covenants, they had no interest in them because they weren't mission-driven organizations. They were basically had units in their building that were purchased for, say, 20 years. 
And once those uh, terms were going to expire, they had every intention of going to the market. So any kind of general fund contribution or a kind of buy down just was not of interest to them. However, our sweet spot really are those uh, projects in which there is debt. So we can look at writing down or writing off interest and extending the covenants that way, looking at options to be able to, at that point, do some light to moderate rehab so we can improve the quality of the home while extending the covenants at the same time. And we track on a monthly basis, like I said, the, the, uh, the activities of not only the, uh, the property owners and those that are at risk, but also our activities against trying to preserve them. And we, we typically will send a report to our council offices, and we can certainly make sure that we get the updated version for you, Councilman. Well, that'd be great. Um, somewhat related, I, I can't have you here without raising my constant complaint um, that the price of construction of affordable housing in the city is um, it's unimaginably high to me for the <laughs> most part. There are buildings that we, not we, that have been constructed usually by third party mm -hmm. providers um, that go up in this town that at, with the per door cost of construction of that building, there are neighborhoods in my district where we could have bought the neighborhood of single family homes mm -hmm. and provided that as affordable housing. And I, until we get a handle on reducing the cost of producing mm -hmm. an affordable housing stock, we're never going to be able to build our way out of this problem. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, it's beyond me why this continues to be a problem. I'm sure there are very real reasons. I know I've spoken with some of the advocates who say uncertainty is a big part of the problem, delay is a big part of the problem, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, that obviously adds to, to cost when someone is making an investment. So can you speak to a, a little bit mm -hmm. to what we can do better to bring that cost down? Well, uh, one way the city is addressing it is offering up at city surplus land. Uh, we've, this department now has approximately 42 parcels that is looking to develop with uh, uh, outside mission-driven organizations, either uh, single-family homes or multifamily homes. So obviously, when we contribute the land, that's going to reduce the cost. As it relates to construction, this is a this is a prevailing issue across the region. Uh, we've tried to look at different ways to value engineer pr uh, products, and it's it's a definite challenge. Um, the subcontractors are really driving the cost up. That it's really uh, un tenable at this point. Uh, exacerbating the point right now about the cost, and when we look at uh, HHH and, and even our, our pipeline of projects that we've got through our, our, our managed pipeline for traditional affordable housing, is the pricing of the tax credits as well, because uh, with 9% low income housing tax credits as well as 4 um, prior to the Trump administration, they were valued at, say, about a dollar ten, dollar fifteen uh, per tax credit. Now they've come down to about 95, 96 cents on the dollar. That means there's less equity investment into that project, increasing the, the gap that must be filled in order to move forward. So you've got competing interest of, of competing issues of both the, the cost of construction as well as limited dollars that are coming into the project. And of course, that gap has to be filled somewhere. Uh, as it relates to construction itself, when we continue to look at other options, again, value re uh, re engineering these projects, but also looking at prefabrication as well as you've probably heard it the storage containers we're still looking at that uh, we've been working with the mayor's office and building and safety to uh, get some level of comfort to be able to uh, get approval for a multi-tiered or uh, multi-story product in in the city of LA right now they're amenable to one but we've got to get to a point where we can get multiple stories uh, you wouldn't necessarily save time uh, save money on the actual um, production, but you'd save time and uh, save money on the time itself. Mm -hmm. And the other issue really is this, get into the weeds, but the, the, it's a different kind of problem. You have to, because you're adding so much weight to the ground, there's this level of compaction. So that's what building and safety is looking at right now, just to what level they can agree to. So we're looking at different options by which to, do, to uh, come up with uh, more inexpensive ways to produce the housing. Okay, great. Um, one final thing on the affordability covenants. Um, but I'd like to ask of you is to report, this will be a special study report because um, I don't think we'll be able to deal with it in time for this budget, but I would like a report on uh, the department's ability to track and enforce affordability covenants as well as other uh, conditions, housing conditions for conduit finance projects that are not financed through the normal affordable housing trust fund okay. process. Um, and perhaps juxtaposing those sorts of projects with those that are funded yeah. through the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Yeah, thank you. I'd, I'd thank be you. happy to respond to that. I figured you might be. Um, all right. Uh, 
That brings us then, I think that covers everything for me. Oh, uh, no, there's one other report uh, that actually Mr. Englander asked that I report, uh, asked for, which is to report back on the additional support uh, that the department has requested for the various HSID managed commissions. If that's not already on our list, I'd like to have that come back as well. And that brings us then to Mr. Bonnet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, first of all, before I forget, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Anna Ortega uh, of your staff, who is uh, a remarkable resource uh, to my staff uh, and to uh, people who are at risk of, of, of being screwed out of their housing. And um, I thank just want to make sure to acknowledge that. <clears throat> Uh, a couple questions. You know, the, w one of the things that has, has, has become uh, an increasing concern around the city, uh, particularly in my district, particularly in the coastal zone, is uh, as we are trying to create more affordable housing is the tremendous loss of affordable housing. Now, uh, that comes in various different forms. It comes in the form of covenants expiring, as Mr. Krikorian talked about. It comes in terms of... Uh, uh, Ellis Act stuff. Um, it also comes in, in, in the form of people cheating their way out of the units that they are required to keep affordable. Um, so a, a couple questions about that. Um, my understanding is that the, the mayor's budget includes funding and continued resolution authority for four positions for the preparation and enforcement of affordable housing covenants. Um, this is the section I understand that prepares and, and monitors the covenants for projects, particularly like density <laughs> bonus projects that mm -hmm. have an affordable housing component. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm curious, what is the anticipated time frame for filling these positions? Uh, with those additional four positions, it'll bring the, t the total group to seven. And uh, we've had some difficulty filling those positions because of lack of qualified lists. Uh, I, we have certifications out right now, so we anticipate hopefully interviewing here within the next several weeks. We, um, I would like, to, would like to say that we were able to get rid of a tremendous amount of the backlog that, was, uh, that we sustained over a course of, of two years or so, and we've been able to bring down the processing time uh, from, any, from 12, 10 to 12 weeks down to six to eight weeks on, on some of the, the mellow determinations um, in AB 2222 or now 2556, mm -hmm. which are, it's critical to get those products, uh, the, the determinations out as quickly as possible. So um, we're hoping within the next two months we should have those remaining four positions uh, filled and be able to reduce that time frame uh, even more so that we can get the, the covenants processed. And... Uh does that also include, I get situations all the time where someone will say, there's supposed to be an affordable unit set aside in this building, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the person who's living there doesn't qualify. Right. Um, is this also the unit that investigates that? Well, they're two separate shops, but they're under the same umbrella, if you will. It's the, the front end to, to do the calculation and record, and then the back end thereafter work with our co consultant, uh, Urban Futures, to do the monitoring of those covenants and respond to complaints. So this, the, we're, we're fortunate enough to be able to get a fee to be able to, that we're assessing to developers to be able to pay for the mm -hmm. processing and then the long-term monitoring. So those resources would go to both. So the four positions right now have been, will be allocated specifically to, again, to address any kind of backlog so that we are able to work with the developers to get the covenants process as quickly as possible. And then at a, a critical point, then we'll shift over at least portion of those resources to beef up the monitoring on the back end. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the other things I hear about a lot is not just that there isn't enough affordable housing, and there isn't, but that it's very difficult for people uh, to find out where affordable housing units do exist. So I'm, I'm curious what the department is, is doing or what resources you have in this budget to do to uh, make more information available about where affordable housing is located. Are we you know, doing a, a centralized database? Uh, is there a centralized place in which people in a neighborhood can find out that there are uh, projects in their communities that are supposed to have set aside units? Mm -hmm. What are we doing about that? Uh, last year, the department worked with the County of Los Angeles and uh, created a brand new portal that has all of the affordable housing covenants 
uh, in the city of Los Angeles. And uh, individuals can go online and access the individual properties. They can see the amenities that are available and then be able to apply uh, for re a residency in those specific units. So it's online now. Uh, we continue to add to that as new projects uh, come online. And as a matter of fact, uh, we opened it up to the county. So if people, if they want to uh, live in the city or live in the county, you know, we just want to make sure that they have access to affordable housing anywhere in the region. So it's available now. If there's a, if there's something we need to do to to work with the constituents to get the word out, we did a, did a blitz at one point when the website was first unveiled last year. We could certainly look at some sort of campaign to make sure people under, know that it's there. Um, you know, I will say that for every affordable housing project we've got, they're oversubscribed four to one, five to one, if not more sometimes. But uh, the, the information is there, and uh, you know, we try to be able to advise people that this, this is a tool that they can access. Um, not to be, yeah, please. In addition, as part of the settlement agreement with independent living centers, and at all the, um, we'll be expanding that website. We're, we're in the process of doing that, and that's going to allow uh, for some additional features, which include identifying which, uh, how many units have accessible features and what those accessible features are, whether they're for mobility or hair and vision impairments. And we're also going to be monitoring, once we're able to kind of staff up, uh, we'll be monitoring the uh, property owners to make sure that they're updating that information um, continuously. Right now, I think it's a little bit static, mostly because there's not a lot of turnover in affordable housing units. But we'll be um, ensuring that, that that website is even expanded and is kept up to date. Not to be too much of a cynic, but this is government, so I need to ask, uh, how is it searchable? Is it searchable by zip code or by address? or It's uh, by zip code. Okay. I so you just type in a zip code and it'll show you everything in that zip code. And it's actually a map, so you can look and you'll see icons for uh, all the all the buildings that have affordability. Okay, good. See, there was no reason for me to be cynical on that one. Um, and uh, I stepped out of the room for a minute. Did anybody ask for a report back on the uh, the, the DV stuff on funding with DV domestic violence? No. no. Uh, Ms. Martinez did. Yeah. Great. Actually, I shouldn't say that. Was the scope of Ms. Martinez's motion sufficient to capture that? I don't think so. All right, then I will ask for a, 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 a report back yeah. on, 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 on how to address the, the, the needs yeah. that were articulated different. by the, the domestic violence uh, organizations today. Ms. Martinez is more about trafficking. Right. So, yeah, no, let, let me ask for a report that's broader than that about uh, domestic violence in general. Um, and uh, just to follow up on the, the last thing you were talking about, Rushmore, uh, when Mr. Krikorian was asking questions about the, um, uh, the, the cargo containers for, for housing, I know you said there's, there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, when do we think we'll get some fi uh, final answer on that? There's not a week that goes by when somebody doesn't send me a message on Facebook about uh, 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 cargo containers in some other city and ask why the hell aren't we doing this in Los Angeles? Well, the conversations are ongoing. I'd like to get back to you uh, next week and give you a better sense of time frame. And I'm not certain exactly all the specific details as far as what's going into the analysis, but uh, I know that th there's been ongoing conversations about that particular uh, housing model as well as others, so I can give you a report back. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bonin, and thank you, Mr. Cervantes. Uh, thank you for your good work and that of your team. That uh, will bring up next, um, we're going to uh, take up homelessness next with uh, Lhasa and Hakla. We have enough chairs? Good. Welcome. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Chairman Kamkori and committee members. Uh, I'd like to introduce my team. Uh, I have with me uh, Chief Financial Officer Stuart Jackson, Director of Policy and Planning Sarah Mayen, Director of Programs Chris uh, Calandrillo, and our Director of Homeless Services, which covers our, our outreach teams, uh, Nathaniel Vergao. Um, obviously representing HACLA is uh, Director of Section 8, Carlos Van Adder. Uh, he's not on my team, but he is on my team. But we're all on the same team. Um, I appreciate Thank the opportunity. You for your letter, but go, go right ahead. Sorry? No, I just said we're all on the same team. So, all on the same. Uh, it's one, thank one you big for your happy letter. family. Thank you for your letter, which we've all considered. Um, but please feel free to go, give, uh, go ahead and give some opening comments. Yes. It, it's be fine, and then we'll go right into questions. Thank you. Um, I want to take uh, an opportunity to, uh, to thank the mayor and his team, Matt and John. I really appreciate the opportunity to work with Rich and, and Yolanda and, their, and the CAO team and their guidance and help in this process. I want to share a few accomplishments from the funding that we received in 2016-17 uh, under the Comprehensive Homeless Strategies and that is uh, impacted in this budget. Through this city's investment in the coordinated entry system, we built out critical elements of a systemic infrastructure needed to coordinate all the services that we are going to need to house people experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. In the city, the system led to 6,749 permanent housing placements in the first three quarters of this year. 8,988 individuals have been assessed through the coordinated entry system, and that is up from 2,544 at the end of second quarter. So in the last three months, the outreach and navigation services funded by the city of LA have assessed more than 6,000 individuals. So those, those teams are fully staffed and up and running. Rapid rehousing funded by the city of LA has housed 2,483 people in 1,986 households, which includes 237 transition age youth for whom we had no such resource uh, previously. And there are more than 4,000 Angelino households currently enrolled in that program. Crisis housing that was funded by the city allowed us to add 496 shelter beds to our existing portfolio, which created a total of 1,653 crisis housing beds under the coordinated entry system. More than 95% of those converted to 24-hour operation, which has led to much greater throughput into permanent housing placements, so that there's a significant increase in permanent pl housing placements that is above 20% now and rising. The stays in those beds have increased. They are a little longer than we had initially projected at turnovers on 90 days or at about 115 days. That reflects some challenge in getting housed, but it also reflects people's tenacity in the beds and their willingness to stay with the program. Winter Shelter funded 952 beds and 4,484 people moved through those beds. There were, there were nearly 5,000 people served in those, in those thousand beds. So it was a very, uh, it was a, there was turnover, but it was a lot of reach through that program. City funds kept two important domestic violence programs from closing their services due to reductions in federal funding, which retained 53 beds. And those were some of those that were addressed in the, in the public comment, I believe, for obviously serving a very at-risk population. City-funded expansion in outreach allowed uh, LASA uh, emergency response teams to engage more than 6,000 people. In, in, that's in, unique individuals, some of which are repetitive. Um, including more than 3,000 with the LAPD uh, liaison hope teams. And even without the highly specific geograph geographic commitment of our CES outreach, which is funded through community-based providers to do similar work, but um, uh, more specifically geographic, in the last quarter, more than 18% of those encounters led to a service connection for those folks. Some of those were connections to employment services or gathering IDs. Some of them were to substance abuse treatment programs, um, mental health treatment programs, and even permanent housing. We work closely with LA Sanitation and LAPD on encampment cleanups, and in that role, uh, ERT conducted twice as many engagements in advance of cleanups than we did during this, uh, in the last quarter, that is to say the first quarter of this calendar year, than we did in the first calendar quarter of 2016. That was more than 300 engagements in advance of scheduled uh, sanitation cleanups. Mayor's proposed budget supports LASA's mission. I'd like to, however, respectfully request the committee consider the request that I made in the letter. I would like to adjust 
um, the downtown drop-in center at St. Julian. We have, that is a LASA owned facility. Um, we have had the operating funds from the city. It is going to be renovated in 2000, uh, in, a, in the 1718 period, but we need operating funds to cover about half that period. So we are requesting about 225. We have um, uh, assurances from our colleagues in CAO that we can work with Measure Triple H funding on the, on the renovation costs, which was something we were also seeking to defray. So we will ask for, reduce that uh, ask to 225. LASA has two HUD grants that we need to match the funds for. So we ask, we need 25% local funds to match those, to draw them down. We split those costs between the city and the county. We're obviously a joint powers authority. So the, uh, the cost there is 62,500 for one of those grants and an additional 125,000 for the other. But that leverage is $1.75 million. So there's a, a, a really important uh, match there that's necessary. And sir, on those, sir. The, the HUD grants are already approved. Those are ready to go. That's not very a good. contingent thing, right? That's correct. Those okay. have been worked. Very good. Thank Those you. Are, yes. Um, I'd like to draw, uh, there was one item that was funded through the UB last year, which was uh, 415000 for right-of-way storage. This is connected with sanitation cleanups. There's abandoned property. They have to store it for some period of time. We contracted with a provider to provide that service, an involuntary service. They, um, but uh, the funds were, uh, I think there was, uh, because it was in the UB and not in our straight line, it might have been over, overlooked. So to, that was a nine month allocation of funding to fund that entire program for right of way storage uh, would take uh, an additional 554,000. That was not in our, in our letter, we, we, we also overlooked it. Finally, obviously, there is a significant reduction in line items that were identified as one-time money in 1617, and they are requested through the Measure H funding process with the county. That occupies most of the space in, uh, in our budget. We have made those requests to the county. We have full confidence in the process. They have, there have been a, a, a number of iterated budget reconciliation processes and our requests that cover these city funded programs have uh, successfully made it through those process. Obviously the process is ongoing. It is not yet resolved and unfortunately it will resolve itself after you guys are done with your work. So there is a, a, some uncertainty there. There is also, um, I am, uh, somewhat of a skeptic with regard to the initiation of new revenues. My concern is that these programs are ongoing. There are thousands of Angelinos in shelter beds. There are thousands of Angelinos in rapid rehousing units. Their rents need to be paid in July. Their rents need to be paid in August. We need to make sure that there is a funding bridge into that next year. However the Measure H funding comes, I feel quite certain that it will not show up July 1. There is just the administrative skepticism in me that says we are going to need to bridge over. This, the, um, uh, I don't you know, suggest that's a, a vote of lack of confidence in our partners at the county. It just, I just, I don't see it. So we are requesting 8.7 million, which is approximately one quarter's worth of burn rate in those current programs to ensure that there is a smooth transition over to county funding, obviously should that uh, emerge. And we have every confidence that it will. Um, we, in, just to, to clarify our approach with regard to the Measure H funding, City funded programs obviously uh, occupy fund, we, we, we do uh, spend both city and county and federal funding. City funds are spent in the city. In order to scale up a program to make a like and similar program that would cover the exact extent of the current program, we need to gross that up. And that's the approach we took in all these programs. So for example, $15 million rapid rehousing program in the city of LA is an approximately $23 million, $24 million program if you scale it up to the county. And we're trying to expand those so we go a little farther than that. That's the approach that we took in all these programs. 
We believe that there is um, that there is every assurance that we will be successful in persuading our, our colleagues in that process to fund these programs. We are, they think they are outstanding programs. They are doing good work. There's no reason why those wouldn't get picked up. If there's a funding gap, it will be catastrophic to those programs. They are not programs you can stop and start. They rely on the goodwill of landlords. They rely on facilities that we could stand to lose if we don't, if we don't fund them. So I'm asking that we bridge that over. We're asking for $8.7 million in that funding. So that does adjust what I asked for. If we, if we add in the uh, storage, the right-of-way storage, um, that would be, which is uh, 554000 the total ask then would be Nine point six, uh, nine, uh, $9,664,435. We do have uh, savings from programs that were, will be underspent, which we recommend funding, you know, applying against this. We think that we will be underspent by about $6.1 million of the $52 million budget that was, that was authorized for LASA for 1617, uh, for which I, I'm happy to cover the reasons for. But the burn rate on those programs, we're probably the most complex request for proposals that LASA's ever undertaken. We, not, not only did we get in, an enormous increase in city funding, we were also given a significant increase in many strains of county funding, and we got a state ESG program that we never had before. We braided all of those funding streams together and put out a complex RFP that covered all the elements of the coordinated entry system, including regional coordination, including outreach in the field, housing navigation services, rapid rehousing, crisis beds. We covered the DV programs that you outlined. There was a number of different things that were funded through that effort. Between the RFP and contracting those, it took first quarter to get those all off the ground. So the results that, you're, that I uh, related earlier are essentially two quarters worth of funding on this, but are expe so there's essentially a, a re reduction of about a quarter in terms of the, the burn rate for these, for these programs. In addition, obviously there were some challenges getting some programs off the ground at all. The storage sites, I think you know, we worked with the council, we worked with CAO, there was very, very significant challenges citing those facilities and we were not able to get those off the ground, not through dint of effort. We went out to bid for the mobile showers and for the um, safe parking, thank you. Um, we did not get any takers. So we went out to the community again and iterated that process. So we're in discussions with folks. Is it the parameters that we put out? Is it the program design question? Is it that this is not a, you know, what is the question? So we're working with additional providers to put that money back out again, but we couldn't get any takers with our initial offering. Um, and then in addition, some of the funding from the city was to cover federal grants that were ending, and those grants, uh, and the contracts ended in, at a staggered rate across and, and didn't end in the exact same time. So there's a, sm a small amount of underspend in that category as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. We'll lead off with Mr. Bonin. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Krikorian, uh, <clears throat> thank you, F Peter, for the presentation and everybody for, for all your work. Um, before I start, Peter, do you have a, an extra copy of the list of accomplishments you read off at the beginning of your presentation? I don't, but I could give you this one. Yeah, I, I'm going to refer back to it in a couple of my questions in a minute, if, um, if somebody could bring it over to me. <laughs> it's written on. That's okay. Um, so l I almost don't know where to begin on this subject, uh, and just so that my colleagues know, I probably won't ask three hours worth of questions like I did last year, because I think it seemed like I asked that many last year, which was our first real budget for, for homelessness. Um, but my initial thought on this is that there, there really should be no time more than now where I or others, observers or folks engaged, should be feeling more optimistic. Voters invested in Triple H, voters invested in H. A little over a year ago, we approved a comprehensive homelessness strategy. Uh, and we have recommended a, a total number of appropriations in this budget of a record number, 176 million. That is amazing. That's cause for celebration. That's cause for dancing on the tables. 
But when you dig down, I can't help but feeling uh, really disappointed and very pessimistic about a lot of what's here uh, for a number of different reasons, and many of them are completely, completely un understandable given some very weird dynamics that, that we're facing. Um, but to hear the, the, the large number of people who are engaged regularly on homelessness coming up here and expressing grave concern about some of the cuts scares the hell out of me. Because not only do we have uh, the, the, not only should we have the opportunity with all the funding sources and all the strategies that have been approved, the voters are sure as hell expecting we're going to be delivering. And they're going to be expecting not just that we're going to have thousands of permanent supportive housing units in eight years, but I think they're expecting that they're going to see fewer encampments and more people housed on their streets. So. Um, this, this budget uh, makes really dramatic cuts in a lot of things that were very core to what we did last year. And we said it was a one-time strategy, and, and clearly we're banking on H funding a lot of that. But as we sit here today, we don't know that that's going to happen. And many of the things that are defunded are street strategy things. And um, while our comprehensive homelessness strategies, the city and the county, are linked and are complementary and are synchronized, there are things in our strategy that are not in the county strategy. And those things are the street strategy. So there's many things that I don't anticipate that the county will be funding, and some of those we're not funding. And the reason that concerns me is I anticipated that this is a year where our street strategy would have seen significant growth. Because when we approve the comprehensive homelessness strategy, sort of a, a, a foundation of our consideration on that was that there were going to be many, many strategies. And it was going to take a while to get the money spent and get the permanent supportive housing units built. So there was a, there was, there was a slide that I'm still trying to find that's, that showed permanent supportive housing. And the funding started small and grew. And street strategy started huge and declined uh, in, 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 in parallel. So that as we had more housing, we had less street strategy. Uh, and as uh, we had less housing, we had more street strategy. Uh, and th th a lot of that stuff is at risk. So if you could start by explaining how we got to this place. As I said, I, under I, I, I somewhat understand how we got here, but I'd like us to get very clear about how we got to a place where some of the most valuable things that we invested in last year, we're, we're, we're sitting here uh, on, on April 28th, needing to approve a budget and being asked to approve a budget that zeroes that, that out with the expectation, the hope, the crossed fingers that the county will fill that hole after our budget is approved. Councilmember, I will jump in on that. Um, I serve on the Measure H Planning Committee along with Peter and Rushmore. Um, the county announced, as your body knows, uh, you gave an incredible addition to homelessness resources last year. They're identified as one time in the budget. The county did as well, and I congratulate, honestly, both sides for that. Um, and part of that was with the intent to go to the voters to ask, can you help us? And the county and the city joined hands and did that. Um, we serve on the Measure H process. One of the very first things the county said in the very first meeting uh, was that they are moving their one-time funding from last year to the Measure H account. We expressed that we were doing the same. 
I think both sides would like to just have more, just like we'd have, like to have more police overtime. But both sides are actually moving the one-time funding to the Measure H account, and both have to, under Measure, under measure H, uh, maintain their basic effort, which we are doing through LASA, and adding additional funds, as you point out, Mr. Bonin, with the properties, with the street strategies, with the departmental strategies, with the sanitation funding, that is actually above and beyond what we believe is part of any maintenance of effort, but just a commitment of the city. So I think that's where we are. Both the city and the county are putting their one-time funding into the H pot. As um, the LASA director noted, there have been, we are in that process. It is not completed. So in a sense, like any grant program, you're not going to get complete overlay about when the money comes in and you don't know what your money is for the whole year. Um, if we end up not getting what we want in that process, I think your body will have to consider what to do with that, just like any grant program. But the current, uh, there has been several meetings of the whole 50 people. Uh, it has now been sent to a work group. The work group has now produced a draft budget for the next three years. And in that draft budget, they do in fact recommend the loss of funding that was to continuation of the loss of funding. And in fact, as Lasse mentioned, expanding it, that they're actually going to become actually a bigger player um, from the street to the rapid rehousing to helping get people into permanent housing. And so we are, the process is not done because their timing is not ours, but it is in fact been an iterative process and the county certainly has said from day one that that is their plan. Um, that has, what is built into this budget um, and so far in that process, we have been successful, at least as the iterative stages have gone ahead. And the loss of funding is recommended to the broader body, which will then take it ultimately to the Board of Supervisors for a recommendation and action. So I, I appreciate that there's a staff recommendation to fund a lot of the stuff, but I think we all know that there are many staff recommendations from CLA, CAO, various departments that don't come through the meat grinder of the legislative process the same way they went in. Um, and uh, just as I wouldn't tell a service agency, oh, don't worry, I'm putting in a motion on this, I, I wouldn't tell them to rely on it until I knew I had eight votes. I don't know that we have the supervisor's commitment that that's exactly what the funding should be and that's what makes it through the legislative process. Again, sir, all I can say is that the county staff has said they are doing the same thing with county funding. As much as they would like to recommend and the supervisors would like to add even more, they are starting with their base of their Measure H proposal being this year's one-time funding. And they have been supportive of the cities to this point. So I do believe it is like, but not exactly, the new SB1 money that's in the budget. You are, in fact, programming new money on the expectation that that competitive process will work out as it should, and it looks like it will. That's not a guaranteed sort of grant that we get automatically, but we expect to get our share, and, and I, we believe that this is a valid way to approach. If either doesn't come through, you will have to make some hard choices, just like you said with federal grants for con plan and others. What are we going to do if the money doesn't come through? There will be some hard discussion. With, with Measure H, the way the county is considering it, uh, is there a formula based on either the population of the city or the homeless population in the city that gives us a, a sum total reasonable ballpark to make a prediction based upon? I actually am... I want to give the county credit and the county CEO's office. They said again at the very beginning that the vast majority of the money, except for specialty strategies, was going to follow the homeless count. It was not going to be some kind of divide by five, kind of follow, follow the homeless count. And they also said and the, at the staff level, and this is the county CEO office, um, recommending the ultimate to their bosses that supporting permanent supportive housing and getting people into housing, the same strategies we have said are most important, um, are the strategies that are the highest priority. But they've been very clear again from the very beginning 
that it's going to fo follow the homeless count, which means, depending on how you look at it sadly or just reality, LA does very well under that model because unfortunately we have the majority of the homeless in the county. So does that mean that no matter which programs we want to fund, we are, we're likely to get a percentage based on that population? Or is the county going to pick and choose, set aside a pot of money for uh, rapid rehousing, a pot of money for emergency shelter, and those pots that they choose to create will be divided by that amount? That's correct. The latter. The latter. Yes. Okay. So, so that means that, I don't know, there's 20, 25 things here that are getting reduced or eliminated. We don't know which of those might get restored funding from H, even with an equitable formula, because they may not choose to do, um, uh, they probably will, but they may not choose to do rapid rehousing, or may, they may not choose to focus on an expansion of emergency shelter. I suspect um, they would rapid rehousing. I have a feeling they might not on emergency shelter. Uh, Councilmember, you are right, and um, to date, the planning group's process and, and the working group that now has come up with a staff report recognizes the importance of the city's priorities as well. It is funding sort of emergency housing, temporary housing, and more in the beginning, early years. That's its proposal. It is saying that getting people into rapid rehousing and then moving people to permanent housing, the same strategies that the city has endorsed are their priorities. So it is true the process isn't done. I don't want to sell you a pig and a poke. But to date, there has been great commonality between the priorities of the city and the city's adopted homeless strategy and the priorities of the county. And some of that goes back to trying to work together to come up with consistent priorities. But and the county has been very fair, county staff, in not trying to just protect county at the expense of city, county at the expense of LASA, to actually follow the need. I, I, I get that and I appreciate it. Although I, I, I have heard from folks at the county from before this process began, and I think I've heard it since this process has begun, that there are certain things that are in our comprehensive homelessness strategy that the county is not interested in funding, storage being one of them. And there are others. Am I correct in that? Yes, sir. What are others that they are not interested in funding? Storage and safe parking, right? In this, oh, go ahead. In this budget, storage is the, is the central one. Obviously, there, there, there was uh, some discussion early on with regard to some of those other street strategies, safe parking and mobile showers, those sorts of things. But they, those uh, ended in this budget request and you know, did not uh, did not make an attempt in the in the measure age. In, in, there was no seat for those for those strategies, no place for them. But storage was the was the major one in this in this budget. What is the county anticipating for expansion of emergency shelter twenty four hours and converting it into bridge housing? That was a, a, a fundamental element of our early strategy. So the, the county followed exactly the same strategy, and we funded, when we went out to RFP using county funds that were, that were allocated to, to LASA, both for general emergency shelter and for people exiting institutions, it followed the same principle, 24-hour shelter, and the same bed rates were used. Um, they were also particularly interested in ensuring that we uh, maintain facilities. So that, I think, you know, the concern that we might lose facilities, citing those facilities is, a, is enough of a challenge that um, there's a recognition that, that, that we wouldn't want to lose facilities that we currently fund. So I'm going to go through your list, some of the list of accomplishments you gave at the beginning. And uh, I was going to ask a two-part question for, 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 for the, the, the bullet points I'm going to read. The, the first part of the question is um, under the budget as currently proposed, would you be able to achieve the same level have a reduction or an increase? With the expectation that the Measure H funding is, is achieved, we would expect an increase in these outcomes. Let me go through them. Um, 6,749 permanent housing placements for homeless Angelinos. Without Measure H, that would not happen again, right? 
without Measure H? And we, if the funding that we anticipate doesn't come through, that doesn't happen, right? I, I mean, assuming that th that the funding for this for the coordinated entry system is essentially zeroed out or down to the to the levels. Yes. Uh, we would not achieve that result. For, th th that's essentially going to be the answer I, I mean, for all of these, right? So we don't have a rapid rehousing program without the city's funding. Right. Our, the full ask is in the Measure H funding. If that, were, if that were zeroed out with this, we wouldn't have a rapid rehousing program through the... So under what we are hopeful that the county will provide under Measure H, would we be able to uh, uh, achieve the same number of permanent uh, housing placements or more? If we get the funding, we would expect to, to increase the number of permanent housing placements, absolutely. By how much, would you say? So I think I, it's I'll, a little I'll tell you what I'm getting at here. Right. Is, is with, with, with street services, we, we know that if we give them a certain amount of funding, we can anticipate 2,400 miles of, of, of streets being resurfaced. I'm trying yes. to get at what, what will we get in terms of deliverables. So. There, we, we do have metrics for those, and I, I, can, I can dig them out. For, under the Measure H proposals, there are a number of deliverables under rapid rehousing, under outreach and encounters, under bridge housing. I can, I, can pull those, I can pull those out, but they're all increases from these numbers that I just cited as, as baseline from the city program. Uh, marginal or significant? There would be significant increases. Okay. Uh, so... Um let me then ask uh, specifically about uh, domestic violence programs. Yes. Uh, under what we're anticipating from Measure H, yes. do they stay roughly the same or do they get a significant increase? Domestic violence shelter beds and, and programs for people who are survivors of domestic violence. There is a significant increase in the beds for uh, crisis housing. There is a proposal to maintain the funding for domestic violence transitional programs that were in this budget. And the specific program elements, program design elements have not been finalized. So the exercise at the table with the Measure H planning process is more of a, essentially a resource allocation decision rather than a program design. They're not, you cannot disaggregate them, but final program design is not, is not the objective of the, of the work group. So, which is to say... I'm, I'm trying to figure out how many more shelter be, emergency shelter beds will we have for women who are fleeing, getting, getting the crap beaten out of them. I can certainly get you that, that number. I can, I can pull it out if you give me a minute, but I can't, I can't tell you off the top of my head. We, we, those, those data are in there. However, domestic violence-specific beds I, is not a program design element other than the very, the very specific funding for the beds that were in this in this budget. So, which is to say, some of those beds can be programmed for domestic violence survivors, intimate partners, sur violence survivors, other high-risk at-need populations. But specific program design elements are not embedded in the current Measure H process to that, to that degree of specificity. That's concerning. But Council Member, again, not to not to repeat, but the current proposal is to take care of the existing numbers and then add crisis beds, which as, as Lawson indicated, the county, at least in their recommendations yet, have not said how they accept, expect to allocate those new beds between different crisis populations, yes. but to cover the existing inventory. So this, I could go through a lot of this, but I don't think I'm going to get the answers I, I want, and it's not your, your fault at all. It's because of this weird process we're in. Um, th this is very difficult for the city of Los Angeles, and it is very, very difficult for the agencies that are out there trying to deliver services. Uh, and it is unimaginably difficult for someone who is homeless or on the verge of homeless or on the verge of being unhomeless again to, to be in this precarious a situation. Has the county expressed any willingness at all? Have we asked whether or not, at least for this first year, 
they would give us a, a block grant so that, that we don't have to have the uncertainty about each individual program. At least we know that there's a certain amount of money that we can spend on these programs. Councilmember, I believe you and other of our elected officials have talked with members of the County Board of Supervisors about doing a sort of a block grant formula of some, either for some or all of it, and taking money off the top. Uh, obviously, it wouldn't just go to the city of LA. Sure. It would go to Pasadena and Long Beach and the San Gabriel Valley Cog, and then you would get into geographic issues that actually might not be as good for the city of LA as following the homeless count, which is actually the, the best way to do it. Um, but so far, at least, the county has not expressed, nor the supervisors expressed any interest in having money off the top block granted in that fashion. I, I don't know that we've a, a, approached them in any comprehensive, coordinated, or significant manner. Uh, and I, I really think we need to do that because I, I, it's, it, it's exceedingly difficult to take this leap of faith in, in, in budgeting. It, it, it may be a semi-reasonable faith but it's, it's a, a, a huge leap with, with real human consequences if it doesn't come through. Um, uh, are, are there any, so th th that's option A, and I think we need to, to, to pursue that. And I'm happy to talk to, to the mayor and to the council president to, to, to see if we can do that. Um, the, the, the second thing is Lasse's concern and suggestion that even if they do approve that money, we're not necessarily going to see that July 1. What can we do about the fact that there are agencies that have hired people, there are housing locators that, 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 that won't be funded, there are vouchers that won't be available, there are rent subsidies that won't be continued as of July 1? Councilmember, we would like to work with LASA and your council on that issue. The, again, the county has consistently stated that they intend to fund the entire full year funding. Uh, they are not, with some programs, as you know, when you get a new tax, we only give nine months funding. They're doing 12 months funding. So their proposed budget is the full 12 months funding. I think LASA and other providers' concerns that there might be a cash flow timing issue are, are real, and we would want to work with your council to make sure that there isn't a cash flow issue. But we expect, again, the county has stated from the beginning, this is full year funding, not partial year funding. Is, but the cash flow issue, we do need to make sure. Is that, that something we can get a report back on before sure. we approve the budget? Yes, sir. And, and as part of that, I think one of the things to, to look at is uh, the potential unspent funds that, 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 that Peter identified. Right. Um, I think that would be So, so Councilmember, I'm sorry, I'm just going to raise a point because I think it's important to note that in terms of the budget recommendations for these programs, it's not just a staff recommendation, but LASA is actually the lead on many of these programs, right? So they're the lead on rapid rehousing, emergency uh, shelter, bridge housing, um, and so they're making the recommendation for the countywide program because LASA is going to run the program. So that's just important to know, right, that this is not just a staff recommendation, but it's actually the strategy lead who's responsible for implementing the program for the city and the county. I, I assume staff meant us too, right? So we're... We want hopes. Um, so, Peter. Yes, sir. If, if I asked, I'm, I'm going to ask right now, what is the street strategy for the next fiscal year in Los Angeles, city of Los Angeles? So I think I would point to uh, uh, a key strategy, which is E6, coordinated outreach, countywide outreach, which is funded at a, a fairly high level in the proposed budget. It includes an expansion of uh, loss at ERT, it excludes an expansion of coordinated entry system generalist outreach that are that are out through our, our our providers, but it also includes an expansion of multidisciplinary teams that are funded through the health agency that are include specialists in behavioral health, in mental health. Those teams, there's 16 of those teams uh, countywide now, would be an expansion to 25 of those. They would cover regional hubs and would be coordinated through outreach coordinators that are funded through the strategy. 
embedded within each regional hub of the coordinated entry system, and then LASA would also have a, sort of a macro coordinator working to make sure that, the, the, that all of that the coordination is happening on the ground. That is taking place right now. This would dramatically scale up the, the efforts on the, on the street. So when I, when I ask about street strategy, or when I read about street strategy, and I see lots of money for sanitation and hope teams, and I hear a lot of money for outreach, um, I'm, I'm unmoved. Um, I've got plenty of outreach. I've had plenty of outreach in my district for a very long time, lots of agencies. They do a lot of outreach, and there's only so many times you can give somebody a McDonald's gift card and give them a, a, a resource card with phone numbers on it. To me, the street strategy is about where can we give place, uh, folks a, a, a place to put their head down that night. Yep. What I'd like a report back on is um, how many people we anticipate getting off the streets, how many people we anticipate contacting under what's proposed, yes. how many people we anticipate uh, uh, providing services to, how yes. many people we anticipate um, uh, getting into uh, emergency shelter, temporary housing, and, and permanent housing. Okay. I, I think as we do this, we need to know what we're hoping to do at the beginning yes. of each year and then look at those metrics throughout the year to, to, to see what's working. So we, we have all of that detail. I'd be happy to present it back to you. Um, it, it certainly is a, is a scale up. And I, I didn't mean to indicate that, that outreach sort of stands alone. I don't disagree with you that the outreach that we have traditionally engaged in is not as effective as it will be when we have a fully coordinated, fully integrated system. When we have an authentic proposition to someone on the street that I have a bed for you, it's a reserved bed, you're not gonna be kicked out of at 6 a.m. And there's a, there's a real prospect of a permanent housing placement at the other end, there will be much more traction with the offer that we have through street outreach. I think that the value proposition we have been offering is not a very valid one because we don't have all the pieces. That is why the traction is so low. Once we put those pieces together in a coordinated system and we are actually placing people into permanent housing using an integrated crisis system of reserved beds, we will see much more traction. Can you tell me how many uh, additional 24-hour beds would be made available under the proposed budget, including uh, hoped for Measure H? One, let's see, 150 new youth beds, 375 new beds for families, 300 for singles, and 250 for high need, high acuity folks through the, the health agency. So somebody's gonna have to help me with my math. That's 1,075, right? So about 1,000 beds for how many people go unsheltered every night in the city? So the entire shelter portfolio, well, it varies because there are people in crisis housing that's motel based and things like that. Um, so it's you know roughly 13,000 over the entire county uh, of Los Angeles. That sounds low, but I'll, I'll trust you on that. Uh, that still sounds like a small number, but it's one we need to keep growing yep. uh, because our neighborhoods need to not have encampments everywhere and we need to have people not out there. Uh, can you tell me, um, there's an organization in my district, Harvest Home, which you may be familiar with, that um, provides housing for homeless women who are pregnant or who have just given birth. And uh, I think they told me that there are a total of 70 such beds in all of Los Angeles County. Uh, and their needs, and during the course of the year, there's about 8,000 people who are on the streets pregnant, they tell me. Um, is there anything in our asks from the county or in what the county's talking about that specifically addresses pregnant women? So there would be eligibility in our, both in our youth, family, and singles for, for, for it, it depends on, on exactly, you know, folks present to our system in different ways. Those would be eligible for, for beds in, in many different uh, aspects of the system. It would, but if you're saying reserved beds for this population, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a specific for the I'd like to get a report that. back yeah. on that, that, that as well. It's a particularly needy and vulnerable population. Yeah. I understand. Uh, I'd also like to um, get a uh, report back on how we can 
uh, restore the funding for um, uh, voluntary storage in Venice. Uh, that's necessary. Um, I know we've had a, a hard time everywhere getting storage going, but if someone's willing to, to do the storage, I think we need to find a way to, to, to provide it. Uh, it's part of our short and long-term strategy. Um, uh, some of that can be capital. Some of that could be Measure H, uh, but then the services still need to be provided, so we need to find a, a, a source for that. So I'd like to report back on that. Uh, and um, a question on uh, surplus properties. When do we anticipate releasing another list of vacant surplus or underused properties for consideration for housing opportunity sites? entire list, but we are reviewing a number of properties now, um, and as soon as those are assessed and uh, finalized for housing development, we will turn those over to the housing department to put out RFPs on those properties. So we're assessing about, um, I think we have a current list of about 17 properties. And when do we anticipate? I, I'm asking because we about a year ago we announced a dozen, and uh, there are folks in my district who are objecting because they don't like them, and then there are folks who are in my district who are objecting because they feel like this is one of the few places in the city that's getting proposed for, for, for two or three or more. And I keep saying, no, this is citywide, and we are going to be looking at surplus vacant and underused properties around the entire city, and a year later they haven't seen anything, and they don't trust what I'm saying. Uh, well, we could definitely, what we could do is provide the list of the properties that um, the housing department has issued our piece on. There are about, I think, 40 properties so far that are that have been out for RFP. Uh, there's a current RFP now that was released March 20th that actually includes one of the properties that was on our list last year. So we can share that with you. I'm not sure I understand. There were, in addition, there were, 10 or 12 that were released, including the, the four in my district for consideration uh, a year ago. You're saying there's another 40 that have been published? So the housing department had additional properties that were former CRA housing sites, and so those have gone out for RFP as well. I think you remember one of the sites from our list last year um, that's in CD8. We put it out again for an RFP because um, Council Member Harris Dawson was very interested in exploring prefab or a container type project. So that is currently out. So we could share that list. Um, there are also a couple of uh, properties that have been um, where we had motions issued to review for housing and homeless housing. So we could also share that list with you. So those are public. But there's some that are not where members have not issued motions, and so those, so those properties are not public at this time. So we could share the entire list with you that's public. Does that are, make sense? Are, are we not periodically issuing more properties sort of in waves for consideration? Yes, we are, but unlike last year, we did not include a list in the budget. So we are assessing properties as we receive motions from members to be able to assess them because that's part of the citywide framework on assessing properties. That's the process that we follow. Before we can start assessing the properties, we need a motion from the council member. Oh, well, you didn't a year ago. Because we because those were included in the budget, and so you gave us authority through the budget. And so, who's driving that consideration? Is it reactive, where you're waiting for a council member to suggest it, or are you? Is departments going to? No, not at all. We're actually very proactive. It's actually the CAO's asset management team. We it starts with us. We we looked at over 500 city-owned properties that were declared surplus. We we're looking now at DOT lots that are underutilized. And so we actually proactively approached council members about allowing us to assess the property for potential housing development. Uh, last couple questions, and I'll, 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 I'll be done. Um, I see that in the budget, uh, 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 safe parking and mobile showers are put in the same line item. I'd like to request that they not be put in the same line item. They're different programs, uh, and I don't understand. I mean, we don't put 
senior lunch programs and the handyman program and the, the, the same line item, uh, they're just, they're, they're different. Uh, they serve the same population, but uh, they're, they're different. So it shouldn't be the same line item. And I'd like to see um, whether or not the, uh, is the funding allocated or recommended, Peter, for uh, mobile showers and safe parking uh, sufficient to uh, the amount you feel necessary for the, the RFPs that are going to be reissued? Let me report back on that. Okay. Yeah, please report back as a budget impact report on that. Uh, all right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence with my lengthy list of questions. And same to my colleagues. Not at all. Thank you. Thank you for your thoroughness. We knew that by starting off with you, we'd probably cover most of the bases. So thank you very much, Mr. Vaughn. And uh, we'll go next to Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. First, I want to give a big shout out and a big thank you to Jose Delgado. Is he here? Jose, say hello. Thank you very much. Um, he's been incredibly helpful to my staff and answering questions, so I really appreciate him. Thank you very much. He's a key man. I have three qu I'm sorry? He's a key man. Yes. I thought you were going to say he's a keeper. Yes. That too. That too. Okay. That's what I say about my husband too. Um, I had, uh, I raised this earlier today, but um, has LASA included funding proposals that would cover services for victims of human trafficking in their request for measure under Measure H? So again, on a specific program design question, um, we have not programmed in beds for that. But I will say that within several strategies, we have considered this population. There is a um, LASA's commission formed an ad hoc committee on women and homelessness. Okay. And in the March 17th meeting, there was a presentation on human trafficking, and there was a, a lot of discussion about the different needs of this population and what programming we need to, to serve that population. The discussion about modifications to our demographic survey for the next homeless count to address this question and try to identify um, uh, survivors of, of human trafficking. Also to, to think through um, different elements of what we can do, including peer outreach in our, you know, peer, peer support in our outreach. But was looking specifically at the Measure H funding, in the strategy that relates to expanding the services under our crisis housing, which is strategy E8, we've asked for a higher bed rate, which in, in part supports um, serving a, a more service intensive population. In addition, in strategy E7, which is our strengthening the coordinated entry system, we have asked for funding for trauma-informed care ac across all of our provider base, which is, I think, a key. Um, you guys okay? Did that window hit you? Sorry about that. So, there, there, so within, the, the, within the different funding proposals, there is, um, there is certainly opportunity for addressing this, and we've asked for funding that will, that will help address this need. We recognize it's, a, you know, it's an under-recognized and underserved population. Okay, great. So I w I'm just going to ask for a report back on whether this population is part of the county strategy under Measure H, H's priorities, and if not, I want to make a recommendation how we can ensure that this population is included. Thank you. Okay. Um, and under Measure HHH, I want to also request a report back on how we will be be able to ensure that this population receive attention and resources as we move forward with building housing and shelter uh, through May measure HHH. And then the last question I had, um, in regards to distributing, what is your process for distributing the transport vouchers? Because this seems to be a real issue, um, at least with my HOPE teams out in my district. What is our process to make sure that we are expediting this in a timely manner? Because there seems to be a lot of roadblocks in trying to issue some of these vouchers to folks who are interested in going back home or we've secured shelter for them and they need to get there. And so in trying to get people off the streets, this seems to be a real roadblock for some folks. How do we expedite the vouchers faster, sooner, so that people get, get off the streets if that's where what they choose to do? Because by the time we actually put it in their hands, sometimes they've changed their mind or they just moved on to something else. Council member, I, I very much appreciate the question. I, I think I would actually dispute the term roadblock. We follow a different process when we're engaging with someone. We don't just give people a travel voucher because they say they want to leave. We, we, do, we don't 
actually believe in sort of a transportation approach only. We want to make sure that they actually arrive someplace where they can get housed, where they can get stably situated. So part of what might appear to be a delay on our side is ensuring that they actually have traction someplace where they land. We, we don't think it's a, it's a fair approach to the individual to give them a one-way bus ticket without ensuring that they have a, a real housing opportunity. Okay, okay I'm going to stop side. you there because um, I'm just not asking this to be, um, uh, because I, I've seen this for myself. I've, I've, we've made contact with the person's um, sister um, in Bakersfield, for example, and there has been hours before we can actually get the person on, on their way there because there have been roadblocks. So when I, met, when I say roadblocks, I, I, don't, I don't want to offend anybody, but that's the reality because I've seen it happen in my district. And so when we're trying to get people back to their homes or back with their families to be reunited, we want, I get it. You want to ensure that this person has a place to, to um, that they can feel welcome. Absolutely. They, they have a home or a shelter. There's somebody waiting for them at, the other, at their destination. Yes. I completely get that. And that I believe we are doing. But there is got to be a more timely manner to be able to expedite this and get people on their way, especially if we've already made contact on the other side to ensure that they do have a safe place to get to. So I'm just not saying that to be difficult. It's because I've seen it for myself. I appreciate that. So what I think I'd like to do is report back on the process for for identifying that and and work with you to to identify any any areas where we can improve the the speed. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have. That makes me look calm. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you. It's too bad Mr. Bonnet didn't cover any of this, so we're really going to have to start from scratch here. Uh, <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about the domestic violence um, funding, and, and we're all very concerned. I'm very concerned. It's an issue I've been concerned with for a long time. Uh, one particular piece I wanted to ask about, which is the the folks who are in transitional housing or the folks who are not um, might not qualify under Measure H, but who we've been serving in the past. Folks who are, are housed and are victims of domestic violence and, and our programs have served. Um, as we transition to a Measure H program, which the parameters haven't been written, uh, what happens to those folks? So, sorry, I pre- I appreciate the, well, I'll I'll project. Uh, I appreciate the question. In the the city's 1617 funding allocation, there was a specific amount of money for the continuity of program, transitional housing programs for survivors of domestic violence that were defunded in the HUD NOFA process. We added that line item per se to our request for funding through Measure H in strategy E8, which is focused on enhanced shelter. Transitional housing is a, is a shelter program. Uh, it, is, it has survived the reconciliation process. It is, it is in there per se as a line item. So the expectation that we would have is that while for the most part the funding allocation decisions have not been made, the continuity of actual facilities and making sure that current programs are not defunded and we don't lose facilities was a priority and that has been embedded in there. So that listing, the, you know, that program is listed in there per se as a, as a transitional housing program. Obviously there may be future discussions about, you know, about the efficacy of that or some, at, some, at some future point, but it is in the current year recommendation. Great. And, and while we keep, we keep beating it to death in some ways, I'm glad that we are because we have folks who are on that committee, yourself included. Uh, to know that that is a as a, as a priority, and as as the, these are these, the the four corners of these programs are written, please keep that in mind. Um, Your council has made that clear, sir. What's that? Your council has made that clear, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the the funding gap, but yes. you know the potential gap, and you, you're yes. asking for for additional a good chunk of money from the city to cover that gap. Is any of that money reimbursable from H if there is a gap? So, so I was if attempting to articulate it more as a bridge than a gap. I have, I don't, 
obviously anything that we that we got fully funded through H and that was an you know an underspend therefore in funding that we have on the city would be would be recapturable to the city. I, I mean, well, I, I guess let me let me reframe it. I mean, if, if we're worried about start dates, so July one comes and not everything is lined up, we don't want to have people drop out of you know not not have programs at that point. Oh yes. Uh, so part of what you're asking is, well, give us some additional money so that we can. Conti you know, ensure continuance for these next, for a quarter, yes, per se. that's correct. Um, but Measure H, I mean, the funding is, they may not have their programs up and running by then, but theoretically, the money is there. It just hasn't been done. So I guess I'm asking, is there a way that we could fund this uh, as a reimbursable, so, you know, we'll call it a loan, call it a, a reimbursable expense, where we could, we could ensure, be a backstop, that, that there is no gap or that, that we're funding this bridge, but from a, a, a budgetary perspective that we could also have some uh, confidence or assurance that we actually might, that money beyond the July 1st, we would be getting back. My expectation is that we would work with the chief administrative officer and the CEO at the county to, to, to work that through. Well, but that's different than what I'm hearing is requested because the request was for dollars. Which is, which is basically, it's all going to get worked out within a quarter. Just fund it for the next quarter, and then it'll be worked out. And, and the, the ask is, is there a way to make it not just straight funding dollars, but a sort of reimbursable expense? So, Councilman, I think the ask was bridge funding, and we will report back on how we do that to ensure that when the Measure H funding comes to LASA, we could get reimbursed for the bridge funding for the qu first quarter of the fiscal year. Does that make okay, sense? Well, that, that's great. And so maybe as we talk about writing it in, in our, our budgetary world, there may be a different way to score that money uh, other than a straight out general uh, fund expense. I mean, both, you know, inter-year loans are very, are practically, you know, cost us nothing. Uh, taking and taking out of the UB or something. There, there are different ways that we could do this through the budget that may, and granted, there's, there's an element of risk. I get that too. Um, and we have to account for that, but that may not be the full, full, full. And, and sir, we agree with that. And again, the county has said these strategies will all be full year funding, not partial year funding, your exact point. There okay. may be a timing issue, which we hope there will not be. But they have said they intend full year funding, not partial year funding. So there is not a need to find three months, six months, nine months. Okay. Well, they've said it's full year funding. Maybe as as part of the report back, you could explain the strategy that we're pursuing because I don't quite I, I understand the concept, but I don't quite understand how we're scoring that in this budget or or the options that we have yes, to score that. And I think they are. We probably have. I can think of three or four ways to do it. So to to. Lay those out would be good. Um, a sort of very narrow question about grants. We're always trying to increase our grants, and, and one of the line items you have is for the homeless management information system, leveraging that. Yes, uh, how much more, with the additional 62000 that you're asking for, what do we hope to leverage from that? That's a, a $500,000 grant. That's a $500,000 HUD grant. What is the, uh, but we're asking for an additional sixty two. Yes. You, uh, you pay 62 and you get 500. Okay, that's usually a pretty good leverage. I, <laughs> I think it's hard to dispute. Okay, and then obviously that's a system to... What's that? What if we double that? <laughs> what if we double that and then get right. money? Okay. Get the same ROI. On and that, that's it. All, all my other questions were, were, uh, were answered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I, Literally, all but one of my questions uh, has uh, have been asked. Um, the the one question I have is very specific. It's relating to the uh, capital uh, and infrastructure uh, investment in the Rose Avenue Venice Beach restroom for a half million dollars, and the North Hollywood Day Labor Homeless Services Center for uh, a half million dollars. As those are both. Uh, brick and mortar projects. I just um, want to see whether they would be eligible for funding with Measure HHH bond revenues and whether they're uh, already assigned uh, uh, to uh, to be paid uh, for with those. 
because right now they're in the um, the UB under capital projects. So in terms of the Venice restroom, I believe that's for cleanup, and no. so. No, no, it's a new bathroom. It's, there's two different things. There's one, the quarter of a million dollars for Venice Beach 24 hour mm. access. There's 1.1 1. 1 or 1.2 million for citywide uh, cleanup and extended hours in 15 locations. And then there's a capital investment. And Mr. Bonner will correct me if I get this wrong. I hope there's a capital investment for a new bathroom at Rose Avenue mm. uh, that, that would be a half million dollars or so. Yeah, so and that's in the UV. In a state of disrepair for about restoration a of it. Oh, yeah. Okay, restoration so, of existing. Yeah, Although so, that's a general purpose public right. bathroom that right. tourists so, use, surfers use. Yes, yeah, so we would have to Cecilia at least on the re, on the capital improvement for the restroom. We'd have to check with Bond Council because it would have to be for uh, majority of users would have to be homeless individuals. Ah, okay. And the okay. same thing with the day labor site. The majority of users would have to be homeless. Okay, well, let's have a close look at that because the North sure. Hollywood site is, it's adjacent to the day laborer site, mm -hmm. but it's primarily designed for homeless services. So okay. that okay. part of it, that component of it, I think should be eligible. But if you could report back, sure. that would be great. Um, anything else, members? Mr. Bonin, did you remember anything else you wanted to add? Just a, a couple quick things. Uh, how did you know? <laughs> um, My skepticism just reemerged. <laughs> do, uh, uh, do we have a, a timetable on uh, when we anticipate executing uh, an MOU with the county over uh, Triple H construction getting H services? In terms of the housing units? Yeah, I mean, we were, we were, we were going to be executing right. an MOU which said that for any unit we built with Triple H, they'd be providing services. Right. So all um, what we need from the county, and I believe the county staff is waiting on this, so if you can help, I think everybody would appreciate it. They need a motion to direct the county staff to start working with jurisdictions such as the city that are willing to invest uh, funding and housing, and they would provide the services. But I do want to say I, that... I'd be happy to submit motions at the county if they let me. Great. <laughs> Um, but I do want to say is that the county is so ready for every every unit that's being financed by HCIT, including the commitments on the projects that are going, that are proposed for the first bond issuance under Prop HHH. Services have been committed uh, by the county for those units. And since we often sort of talk about our fights with other governmental entities, this is one where the county has been a total partner. They, and they said at the very first HHH meeting that they will serve units that come online, period. You know, and even depending what happens with housing vouchers in Washington, we will figure out a way. You build a unit, we will serve it. That is our obligation and our commitment. So Excellent. I want to give them lots of credit on that. Okay. Yeah, that, that wasn't a, a pejorative question on my yeah. part. I mean, the county has been a phenomenal partner, absolutely phenomenal. Um, uh, just a couple quick, very quick questions for Hackla, because I forgot you guys were here. Uh, are we, because I had so much focus on, on grilling Peter. Uh, are we expecting any additional funds from Measure H to fund hotel motel conversion programs or the landlord incentive program? For the landlord incentive program, um, that was an issue that we're concerned about, as Peter mentioned, because the, the funding is not there for the level that we need, but we'll be pressing them to increase the amount of funding for the homeless incentive program. Right now, um, they have in the budget that the funding would be $2,000 per family, and we really need $3,500 per family. That includes all of the components of the homeless incentive program, which is the signing bonus, security deposit assistance, uh, damage mitigation fund for when uh, someone leaves having caused damages beyond the security deposit. And the motel conversion program? Motel conversion is um, funded through our project-based voucher program, so that remains with us. And as a matter of fact, we have a NOFA on the street right now, which allows uh, developers to submit proposals for that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now I'm done. Thank you. And uh, I just realized I had a couple of questions from uh, Mr. Englander. One, the first of which I think has already been addressed, which is um, 
the issue of uh, the likelihood that we may be underfunded in areas uh, that may be fundable through Measure H proceeds if those proceeds don't manifest. I think we've actually dealt with that at great length. Um, and his other question was, since LAPD spends about $100 million worth of time on homelessness, are there funds available to help to achieve their overtime needs for both sworn and civilian personnel relating to homelessness-related uh, services? So I'm going to ask for that in the form of a report back on behalf of Mr. Inglander. And I hope the answer is no. <laughs> And uh, anything else, members? Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time, and uh, thank you to, to your entire team. <laughs> so, so that will bring up next the planning department. Mr. Bertoni, welcome, and thank you for your letter. Thank you also for your patience you. uh, in being towards the end of the day. Uh, feel free to go ahead, and we have received your letter. Thank you very much, but feel free to go ahead and open up, and we'll get right into questions. Uh, thank you, Chair Kukorin and members of the Budget and Finance Committee. Uh, Vince Bertoni, Director of Planning, and who I have with me today is to, uh, to your right, uh, Jan Satorsky, uh, Deputy Director, who handles uh, administration. Then next to her is Lisa Weber, our Deputy Director, who handles uh, development projects. And then next to Ms. Weber is Kevin Keller, our Deputy Director for Policy. Um, first off, we'd like to thank the Mayor's Office and the CAO for proposing a budget that provides us the resources in city planning that will uh, really allow us to achieve the city's major planning initiatives. Um, we're grateful for the budget that um, adds for more, that will allow for additional more services, which are gonna be tied to uh, greater cost recovery. Um, so the greater cost recovery will not just, ha not just um, take care of the services that are proposed, but will actually reduce um, our need to, on the general fund or our, our dependent on the general fund by about $2 million a year or a 16% reduction. Um, in the 15 months I've been here on the job, um, we've had the opportunity to really make some improvements to our department in terms of its operations performance. We've been able to deliver some new services, um, both you know, in terms of at our, at our development services center where we've actually been able to increase our staffing there by 30%, um, establish more services, as well as decrease our wait times while our, while our activity has gone up, we've been able to decrease the wait times at our development services center. We've also implemented a geographic restructuring of our case management. So now our, case, our cases are processed geographically in the city, so council offices and community members get to, uh, get to understand and get to know their planners better. Implemented a one project, one planner system. So planner, instead of having to go to a multiple planners, if you have one project, you only have to go to one. And on Monday, we'll be opening up a new development services center in West LA, so we're really excited about that. Um, this last year, we've been able to um, complete uh, our neighborhood conservation program, which was which is guarding against mansionization and 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 trying to preserve uh, the particular neighborhood neighborhood character throughout our city. Um, and so, as part of that, we've adopted 16 new variations of our R1 zone. We've applied them to 15 different neighborhoods, and and really. Um, changed and strengthened our, our both our baseline mansionization, our baseline hillside rules. Along the way, we've adopted five new HPOZs, and we did all of that, or historic preservation overlay zones, and we did all of that within the deadline of, how, of March of this year when, it, when some interim control ordinances were, were expiring. We're really looking forward to what we can do beyond that here as a department and as a city. Um, we'll be moving forward on a citywide general plan update that will create a blueprint of how we can both um, protect our neighborhoods as well as look for opportunities for jobs and housing and uh, it, for, our, for both our existing and future residents. And we're hoping to have your support to, um, as the mayor's budget has proposed, to really expand our community planning program, which would update all of our 35 community plans in a six year time frame. Um, this has never been done in, in the city's history and we're very excited for that. 
Um, the one thing that is in our letter is we're asking for um, an increase in our historic preservation overlay zone program to add four positions. We've really, this program has really grown over the years as well as the caseload has grown as the, the economy has recovered. So we're really hoping that we can provide the services that we, we need to provide there. Um, we have been really working hard to streamline our program and, and we've actually, the city council adopted new procedures this week which will um, be a great benefit. But this, pop, this program is very popular, it continues to grow. Um, as I mentioned before, we just added five new, five new uh, HPOZs this year for a total of 35. Um, so I, I, I just want to, again, reiterate how much we appreciate uh, the work of, of um, the mayor's office and the CEO and also the support that this department has had over the last several years from the city council in providing us the resources. And, and we're really moving diligently to get those resources in, in place so we can take care of the programs that this council has really been looking forward to. So thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, we will start with Mr. Blumenfield. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And you've done a lot in these 15 months, and uh, you really have hit the ground running. And, and we feel it, and the city feels it. So starting with a little bit of gratitude. Um, question, last, the last year we increased the resources, the hiring authority, to update our long-neglected community plans. Finally, we're, we're moving forward on that. This year's budget goes even further. Tell us a little bit about the progress in terms of filling those positions and, and beginning to tackle those community plans. Right. Uh, thank you. We are um, just overall, just to give you a, uh, um, where we are in terms of overall hiring in the department. We um, hired, since I've been here, we've brought in about 75 net new positions. You know, we lose, that's in addition, in, um, that's accounting for attrition. So we've actually hired much more than that. So we've, we're actually up, we've actually been able to hire a great deal in terms of positions, but we still have many more to fill. Um, and as part of that, we don't just hire new positions. Although we've had net new 75 positions we filled, we've probably promoted up about the same amount, about 75 too. So we're both promoting and filling. So that's the, that's the, the, the approach that we have. Um, we've been able to really start to fully, to start fun, staffing up our community plan teams. Um, we're finishing up several community plans. As, as, as you uh, may know, we just finished up West Adams um, and we adopted it, the implementing ordinances. San Pedro has been, um, has been recommended by our planning commission off to the city council. South and Southeast LA are, are um, in circulation. Hollywood's imminently to be circulated. Central City, Central City North and Boyle Heights we expect to have is un are underway. But in addition to that, we've, we've, been, so we've been, been applying resources there. We're actually been able to hire up and we've started to staff a policy unit in the Valley for the Valley office. So we're looking forward in the near term to have a, to be looking at updating community plans in the Valley um, over the next few months we'll be starting up. And that's very exciting because we didn't have policy staff in the Valley for many, many years. So we actually just reintroduced um, policy staff to the Valley as well as other staffing to the Valley. We actually brought um, senior planners, which we didn't have there before. So we're in the process. It's, it's to fully fund the program, to, to fully get up and running the program as envisioned which is the six years to update all 35 community plans in six years, we probably won't be fully staffed into next, next calendar year, into 2018, to get the program up and running. But the next one we're looking at is in the Valley. Well, great. So, I mean, it, it is a big deal to go from our 10 years now down to six years. You feel like you have the resources to do that, and along with the time frame to do all the public uh, participation and outreach that's needed for that? Um, yes, and, and with the proposed budget and once we're able to hire them, we feel confident that we're going to be able to handle the programs in the time frame. It's going to be an aggressive schedule, um, clearly. Um, we feel that, that we'll be able to provide the plans and update them technically, um, get the environmental impact reports done. The one part which is always the unknown is, is what it takes to get consensus on a plan. Because these plans, we, we want to have them la have longevity at least 10 years, and we want to be able to build consensus with all aspects of the community. And that's always, you can't always predict that. We can predict how long it's going to take us to do our background analysis, write policies, do an environmental impact report. But that consensus is going to be something that, that we're going to, that's the, the unknown. But we're actually working at ways to, to look at doing community engagement in a different manner, which we hope is going to be more meaningful. Yeah, I think that, that is going to be a bit one of the challenges. Um, the Valley Development Services Center, the geographical project planning teams, 
as you know, have seen a jump in, in casework okay. project reviews for the last year. Uh, the department also reorganized how you undertake the ZA cases, okay. which added to the workload, but there are no new positions for the geographical project planning team. How is that casework going to be dealt with? Mm -hmm. Do you need new positions? How are we going to deal with the backlog? Is we, we have some backlog because we haven't been able to fill all the positions we've had funded so far. So we are just overall in the department. We currently have around 350 uh, positions filled. Our budget's for about 420. So we're still, you know, 70 under where we are. And those are both policy and development pro um, positions as well as the administrative and, and um, IT positions. So we feel that once we get those positions filled, we should be able to handle um, the backlog as, as it is now and to, to, be, to be able to more fully staff it. Okay. Um, now, a broken record thing. We've talked about this one. You can probably fill in the blank for me, but <laughs> when will the Valley Geographical Project Planning Team get a principal planner? We're looking at filling that position this summer. Okay. We actually have to go. We have a list that's been expired, and we need to do a new um, list. So... Yes. I kind of knew the answer, but you, you, you probably knew I was going to ask Excellent. it on the record because we, we talk about it. It's important for, for the area. Okay. Um, many of the specialized program planning offers, such as the beverage and entertainment streamline program or the case management program, um, are only available in the metro office. Mm -hmm. What resources would be needed to expand them to the valley? Are there any technological solutions that could expedite uh, their availability to the valley? What, how do we solve that problem? I think that, well, there's, um, there'd be a few issues to, to try to, um, one of the things, which is a good, it would require additional resources to try to bring those programs to the Valley, um, to the Valley office. There is also, will be, will be a little challenged, quite frankly, in space, on office space. Since we've been staffing up, we're, we're starting, so we've been um, filling up our spaces in the Valley, so we're getting quite full now. Um, so we would want to have to, we'd have to take a look at that in terms of what it would take for, for both staffing what, and... What, why don't we do that as a report back then to absolutely. see what it would, what it would take to, to fill those positions and to uh, create some parity there for the Valley. Uh, another issue, where the new fee study is, the new fee study um, has been done that will propose a raise in the planning entitlement review cases. Uh, when do you expect this to come before the council? What is the impact if the fee update is delayed? We've submitted the fee study, um, so we've we've we forwarded that on. We've did, so it's I think it's a matter of it getting scheduled for the city council right now. I believe. Um, our office and the city attorney's office are currently working on report backs to the policy committees, and we intend to transmit those reports next month. Um, and the expectation is to. Um, get that before the policy committee sometime in May. Um, the chair of the Plum Committee is aware that these fee reports will be coming before him. Right. And obviously there's a cost to, to, to delay. I'm giving you a chance right. to, to weigh in on that. Right. The, the fiscal year 17-18 budget assumes that the fees will be in place in July. Um, so we are assuming the additional revenues and that the departments will be offsetting the general fund subsidies that they currently get um, to offset the related costs for the positions, and that's reflected in the budget um, through the $2 million reduction in general fund, sub or general fund appropriations. So we anticipate that it's going to go smoothly. The department has already drafted the ordinances necessary. Um, the city attorney's office is just reviewing it for form and legality. Great. I just wanted to put that out there and help push it along. Um, the Recode LA process is coming to a close. It, well, it's, it's coming closer to reality. Um, but it hasn't been all that public in terms right. of folks in my right. district don't necessarily know what's going on. I talk about it in meetings and people perk up. Um, what are we doing to, to get the information and the updates out regarding a comprehensive uh, outreach on this in terms of the rezoning? Uh, uh, thank you. It, well, what, what, how Recode LA is being handled is we're actually creating, if you will, toolkits for a new zoning ordinance. So what, we, what we're, what we're going to be doing is coming up with the, the new zones. We will not be uh, applying them. We won't be mapping them, applying them to any place um, separately. So what we'll do is we will apply the new zones when we adopt the new community plans. So what we're doing right now, we're coming up with the zones. Uh, we did, the first part of it was actually our R1 zones, the 16 R1 variations. That was actually part of our 
our um, Recode LA effort. And so we took the Recode LA effort and we kind of moved over to the community planning part of it to uh, come up with the, the 16 zones and then apply them through community planning. Um, so we will be going back out when we start coming up with the new zones. We did that for the R1 zones. We got lots of input from the public. We'll be coming, the, the next part I believe is the multifamily zones and multifamily variations and then we'll be coming back with um, processes and procedures. So as we bring those various parts of it, we will be doing the public outreach and engagement. And then again, when the community plans get updated, then there'll be another opportunity as you update the community plan to, for the community to be involved with how do you apply the right zone to the community plan designation. So there's, there's gonna be in essence a two-step process for that. Right, because right now most people are just thinking we're, we're updating with the existing zones. Right. They don't realize the whole panoply of new possibilities. Right, and, 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 and that's gonna be, I think, one of our, our greatest challenges with Recode because when we, we're gonna be going and asking people what do you think about multifamily in general? And we're gonna hope that we get really good engagement and feedback, but it may not really be real to everyone until we start to apply it to their neighborhood and see what it looks like. So that's why we wanna make sure, that's why it's important under Recode that we have enough flexibility in the zones and that um, a, as we apply them. But I gotta say, we were, it worked pretty well in the R1 zones because we came up with the zones and then we applied them to the neighborhoods and we seemed to get pretty good consensus as we applied them to the neighborhood. Um, surprisingly so. So we're hoping that we could have the same success with the rest, rest of the code. Great. Uh, last question is um, concerning cannabis and planning for that. There's been Prop 64. Mm -hmm. We're going to be doing a lot of uh, writing of regulations this next year. But, and, and a big part of that is going to be the land use aspect of it. And I don't see anything really in this budget that talks about about how we're going to plan for that. Do you have the resources necessary to, to deal with this new planning challenge? What's, what's your plan for tackling the land use issues surrounding legalized cannabis? Well, the, not, all of the, not all the regulations are actually within land use. We're, we're a part of that. But I would like to do is defer to um, Deputy Director Kelly to kind of get a little bit more into the, the details on that. Sure, Kevin Keller, uh, Deputy Director. The cannabis ordinance, a very hot topic. Uh, we do feel we have enough resources at this time. The department did receive an advance for some uh, mapping and GIS service work where we're currently mapping a lot of the sensitive uses to develop um, distancing requirements that could be used to inform the cannabis ordinance as it evolves. Um, we do anticipate uh, releasing an internal draft of, of the actual cannabis ordinance in terms of its land use controls, uh, probably as early as May. And then uh, in having these maps that we can report back through the Plum Committee to share some of the maps and options. We're working off of Prop D, a lot of the restrictions, 1,000 feet from a school, 600 feet from a, a youth center, things like that. We're mapping the options to show the remaining sites that are available. The goal would be that though once those maps are prepared, they help to inform the city's ordinance that then has its own life. We don't anticipate at this time that those would become planning entitlements once they would maybe be a checkbox, but we look forward to the council kind of creating that process, and then we can report back if there actually is a planning process after that, we'd have to develop a fee schedule and a workload for that. So for the initial ordinance, we're working, we're meeting almost weekly with the city attorney and related departments, and we look forward to releasing that draft this summer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bloomfield. Um, Mr. Blumenfield touched upon the uh, community plan updates, which is a subject near and dear to all of us, and we're all eager to expedite this. I haven't gone back to check last year's budget, but my recollection is that last year we added positions in planning in order to expedite uh, the updates, mm -hmm. and then this year we're adding an additional uh, 24 right. positions. So both with the same right. metric, the same goal of the six-year refresh. Um, so, can, am I right about uh, that? The, 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 this year's budget is a 10-year cycle, and the next year's, the, the proposed budget would be six years. Okay. So, yeah, I, I should have so mentioned position, that in my presentation. <laughs> okay. So, the positions were added last year, but retaining the same refresh schedule. The new positions this year will be sufficient to... Um, expedite that to six years. Right, so this year's budget was a 10-year cycle. Next year's budget with the extra positions would, would, would shrink that to six years. Okay, very good. Now, um, you... Right. 
Right, and getting to 10 in itself was a reduction. So there was, there's been multiple steps to get there. Thank you, thanks for the clarification. Now you mentioned earlier that you have a substantial number of unfilled positions, uh, funded unfilled positions. Right. And I, I wanna get a little bit more from you about right. what the challenges are there in, in getting those positions filled. I mean, it, it's, it's up till now, it's, it's and, and we've had a really great relation, working relationship with personnel and they've been very helpful to, to expedite those. But we're, what we're challenged with is we're doing both promotions and filling positions and there are many, many classifications. It's just not planners. It's, it's, a, it's, it's about five levels of planners that we're hiring. We have maybe another five or six different administrative positions as well as things such as um, IT and, and, and so forth. So there is just the process to hire so many different positions at once, meaning means that we're going on and doing many, many different lists. So it's not as if we're hiring one list and just working our way down that list. We're really working our way through, you know, maybe 10 lists that we go through through, through civil service. So that's part of the challenge. And we also, as we go through, we're not just hiring new people, we're actually promoting um, people along the way. So there's that part of it, which is just a logistical challenge. Um, we average just um, a month, we average about eight positions we hire. If you're just to, to level it all out, we average about hiring eight people a month. We lose about two, so we net about six. Um, we're probably moving that up to netting about 6.5 right now or seven. So one of my goals is to really get that up to more of a netting more closer to 10 um, a month, and that's realistic. A few things to keep in mind, because the council's been, been very supportive, we've been getting new positions, and through natural attrition, about, um, we're at a point now where about 40% of our department's been here less than two years. So we also have another part of that in the sense that you, as you have a department, you grow a department, you want to, you don't want to take on everyone at the same time. You need to be able to bring people on board and to understand and get to know the, 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 the rules and the culture of the organization. And another aspect of it is even if we, we're still dealing with an external talent pool, largely of city planners, and at any one period of time, there's only such a, a certain talent pool out there. And so we've been working through that as we go through. I have to say we've had, um, we've hired some really exceptional people over the last few years at a very high standard. And it's very important to us because of our civil service um, system, we have the most um, le freedom or ability to hire people at the very entry level and then it's all promotion. So it's, it's very critical we hire the right people because we're probably gonna have them for 10 or 20 or 30 mm -hmm. years, which is a good thing, but we wanna make sure that we hire the right people to bring them up through the process. One of the things that we've done that we haven't done in the past is we really opened up more positions to outside um, than we have in the past, and that's been able to get us to, um, to fill those more quickly. And I think we're gonna have to do more of that because we're going to have to be, when you're looking at the number of people we're gonna have to hire, we're going to have to still have more experience. You know, we, we need to make sure we get the experience as we grow. So we've actually, since I've been here, we've opened up additional positions to the outside to help move that along, and we're really hoping to see um, the results of that as we go through this next six months. Great, well, I think you're making great progress. I would just urge you to the greatest extent possible to expedite filling those positions because these are obviously important priorities for the council, so, which is why we're funding these positions and, um, and we need these services filled. Um, you're actually quite blessed compared to some of the other uh, departments that you don't have 40% of your workforce looking at retirement within the right. next two years. I mean, this is right. uh, actually very healthy that I think you're building right. a department that will be able to plan the Los Angeles yeah. of, of the rest of the century, so. Um, okay, so Recode LA. Uh, the four additional positions, or the continued uh, funding in the four positions to support Recode LA are uh, funded with a temporary increase in the general, general plan maintenance fee. Right. Um, is that in fact a temporary increase? So when this workload, th this is a discrete workload, um, mm -hmm. once that's finished, right. Would it be the expectation that the fee would be reduced, or would it be the expectation that the fee would then fund some other service, maintenance of the, uh, right. something else? What, what's the plan with that? Right, and what the city council has tentatively given us the okay to do, and we'll be bringing back the ordinance fairly soon, is to look at those fees. So what are, how our fees are structured for long-range planning is we adopted about, um, 
a little less than 10 years ago, I think eight to 10 years ago, a general plan maintenance fee, which was a 3% that's, that's tacked on to um, permits. And, um, and that, that really funded a lot of our long range planning, our general, a citywide general plan, our community plans. The city council subsequent to that adopted a 2% for recode in addition to 3%, which was temporary that was set to expire at the end of this calendar year. Um, what the city council um, gave us the direction to do was to keep the 3%, which is a permanent anyway. The 2%, which was, which was set to expire, would, would, would not expire, and we'd added additional 2%. So, and those fees would all be in one, it would all under come, come under one fee for the general plan maintenance fee. So in essence, the 3% becomes 7% um, and as a permanent ongoing fee for the general plan maintenance fee. So okay. we take the, the, the original 3%, take the 2% temporary and make it permanent and add an additional 2%, that gets you to the seven. Okay, and the positions that are funded through that accumulation of layers of, of fees. Are those fully funded, including related costs? I believe so, that those are all fully funded fees, I mean positions. Um, Jason Clean Ops with the CEO. The majority of the new fees are actually going to go to support the expanding community planning program. So in the blue book, you see that we funded four months for the 24 positions that were added this year. Um, those positions are fully funded, direct and indirect, for next year. Um, there will be an ongoing general fund component to the community planning program. So the policy decision in fiscal year 1819 will be whether or not it's appropriate to fully fund the positions within the department and have the general fund subsidize the related costs or do split funding for positions. And okay, but for this year, as long as that work is ongoing throughout the course of the budget year, it's fully recovered, including related costs. Correct. Great. Um, okay. Oh, um, can you talk a little bit about the en enhanced case management uh, program? Uh, we're continuing funding for two positions uh, for enhanced case management and two positions for expedited case processing and three for expanded expedited case processing. Mm -hmm. How is that going? I mean, what's the, what's the vector between um, those uh, cases that have uh, expedited processing and those that don't? Um, what impact is it having on those cases that aren't participating in this right. program? Are they being adversely impacted? How is that coming along? Well, if, think about our case processing in basically three different categories. We have a, a section, we, we basically do all of our just kind of general case processing um, as, as one area. Now separate from that is major projects and the defining feature is a major project has an environmental impact report. And so we've created a unit that, that, that we were struggling getting environmental impact reports done in a timely manner and having the consistency we needed. So we, we, we kind of reorganized to have the major project unit really look at all the EIRs and to have the, really the te technical expertise to do that. Now, expedite is separate from that. We, don't, we put in expedite projects that don't require an EIR um, and that, that we can, in essence, guarantee, but we're guaranteeing expedited processing as a certain timeline. When you turn in your application, we will get it, we will look at it within a certain period of time and get it complete and get it to a hearing within a certain period of time. Um, so those are the projects that we put in there. So we actually, within Expedite, really look at very, very specific schedules. So it is, it, it, it's something that is, that is different than the, the, the typical case processing, and those do take longer. Um, but we also have, we've also narrowed a little bit the types of projects that can go into to expedited that can make, so we can actually uh, follow through on that guarantee in terms of time. Um, I'm gonna uh, let Lisa Weber get a little bit more into the details of, of how, what the timelines have been for that. Lisa Weber with the Department of City Planning. So the expedited uh, case processing section uh, guarantees a 90-day turnaround from the time that a project is deemed complete to the time that you have your initial public hearing. Uh, the program was established a number of years ago mainly to uh, help speed up the uh, entitlement process for housing and affordable housing. 
Uh, the Expedite program has been very successful. It's been very popular among the development industry. And in fact, we've expanded the range of cases that we actually accept into that, into that particular section. So we're doing more hotels now and more non-residential square footage uh, type projects as well. Yeah. It, the metaphor I think of is kind of like the carpool lane. And if, you, you know, if somebody pays uh, to be able to drive in the carpool lane and you're not yeah. adding lane space, um, you're adding congestion in every other way uh, by setting that aside. And Mr. Bonin, let's not start debating this now. We have, we'll do that in, at MTA. But, <laughs> but um, that's sort of the metaphor that, uh, that I think of. And if we're not expanding capacity, um, we're hurting some projects in order to help others. Yeah. So tell me that, that, that we're moving in the right direction to avoid that. Absolutely. Um, we've, uh, uh, our intake process, we actually uh, took on some uh, streamlining measures in our expedited case processing under our uh, new uh, management with senior city planner Nick uh, Hendricks, who um, uh, really expanded and modified the way that we intake projects into expedite and move them through with two dedicated associate zoning administrators. So we've really, in 2016, we're able to double the number of hotel rooms, for example, that were entitled. And uh, again, that significant increase from about 900,000 square feet of uh, commercial space entitled to 1.7 million in calendar year 2016, uh, with the same number of housing units still getting through the, the process. So again, I think um, we've heard very positive things from the development industry, and they want more. Uh, and so this additional three-person unit will uh, provide us that kind of capacity. And, and Councilman, you also asked about case management as well. We're asking for a uh, supervising ci uh, city planner and a city planning associate and that into the existing case management unit, and that will afford us the ability to create three two-person teams that are geographically based, one specific to the Valley, one specific to Central, and one specific to the West, South Los Angeles areas. And so those three uh, case management teams will work very well and correspond with our geographic teams that are doing the case processing work for those respective geographies. If I could just, if I could, it's okay sure. to add one thing. You know, great question and, and great observation. It's something that I've always debated throughout my entire career you know, as a planner is of, of, of expediting or not. And what I, what I think about L.A., which we're so large and we have so many different cases, that I think in L.A. is a place where I think it probably makes sense to have something like expedited case processing. But it's not that we're not paying attention to the normal case processing. Our one project, uh, one planner model is based upon expedite. So expedite was really the experiment, and we realized how it worked. It, how well it worked, so we moved over to geographic case processing. So we think that's been su successful. What we're really going to focus on this next year is, is actually metrics and, and a performance management unit. We haven't done a really great job in the past, quite frankly, of really measuring how we're doing. So we're actually dedicating some full-time people to that to create efficiency. So I'd rather, instead of asking for more planners, I'd rather just dedicate a few people now to really analyze and measure what we're doing to see if we can just make our process a lot better. Great. Thank you. Um, the draft uh, proposed budget includes a million dollars uh, in the UB for short-term rental enforcement. And um, I don't, I mean, obviously we haven't developed a body of policy yet around this yeah. issue, um, but is, the, is it the department's plan to include both short-term rental tracking and enforcement within uh, one shop? In other words, will all of the issues relating to the administration of short-term uh, rental enforcement reside within planning, or will there be other uh, well, departments that will be engaged? It will, there will necessarily have to be some involvement, obviously, from code compliance in terms of how we implement it, but there's really a tracking mechanism that, that planning is going to take the lead on, and I'll let uh, Mr. Keller kind of get a little bit into the, the details of that. Uh, sure. Kevin Keller, uh, City Planning. At this point, as you know, uh, the Planning Department and Commission has prepared a draft ordinance. It's uh, awaiting council determination of where that policy lands. Um, there are a number of factors, including the enforcement of the ordinance itself, which is going to be critical. Um, one of the components, regardless of the details of the ordinance, is actually constructing 
a, a digital portal that the city can use to register guests on these uh, shared uh, platforms, and we do anticipate um, that program running around that range. So that would be at least one of the expenditures that we would want to move forward and planning would likely take the lead in um, overseeing that kind of the contract. Beyond that, I think there's still some debate and discussion about where the actual enforcement lies. We normally work with our building and safety colleagues, but I think on this one, there may be, a, there may be an, an, uh, an enhanced planning role to help oversee the program. That's a policy decision we'll have to discuss. Okay. Um, CEQA. A uh, big challenge that we have in updating the community plans is always CEQA challenge and uh, so many other things as well. So what's the status of updating our CEQA thresholds and aligning them uh, more closely with, uh, with state thresholds right. and uh, current state environmental law? We are actually, ha those, the CEQA thresholds update is actually underway. So that will be completed this year. And that's going to both, as you mentioned, bring us more in alignment with the current state of of today's uh, guidelines, the state CEQA guidelines. But what we're also going to do is getting ahead of, we'll be getting ahead of the state when it comes to how we measure things such as traffic. Um, the state gives us some flexibility there to move from level of service, which is an auto-based, auto-congestion-based way of measuring traffic to vehicle miles traveled, which is more your experience. How far do you have to travel? How often do you have to travel? So that in and of itself will, will do a lot of things, but one of the things that we'll do is is you know it's really going to um, you know size and our, our conditions in the correct way and and also match up what what we what we need to do from an environmental standpoint with what our goals are as a city as we're a very different city than we were before um, we moved to that to that method when I was in Pasadena um, the first city in California to do that it's been very successful there so we're hoping to bring that here there's a lots of there's lots of things we can do under the CEQA, the new CEQA thresholds to help and and we're we're estimating to have that done this year okay great. Uh, and then finally, on behalf of Mr. Englander, um, he observes that with the increased citywide interest in planning matters, land use training for both decision making and advisory bodies is desperately needed. Uh, he'd like to get a report back on whether the department has any plans to create and formalize training programs as a function of their outreach team and whether this function is adequately funded, particularly as it relates to neighborhood councils and other community-based organizations. Um, we're happy to do a report back. We, there was a, a, some training unit that was funded previously by the city council, which we are, we're, we're starting to staff right now. In addition to that, we're actually bringing on a communications t um, staff for the first time in the department's history, which will help on our overall communications, but I'm happy to have a report back in terms of, of how we plan on what are the strategies we can do for communication as part of the, the um, outreach on the community plans? And terrific. And then that should also encompass the aspect of training for neighborhood council board members right. as well. Okay, Absolutely. great. Thank you very much. Um, that's it for me. Mr. Bonin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Vince and your team. Uh, there was a few years there where I was not the biggest fan of the Department of City Planning, and uh, I think you guys are awesome. Uh, I think it, uh, the, the transformation that you've led in the department has really been phenomenal. Uh, uh, you have amazing people, many of whom were there when I wasn't as wild about the department as I am now, but uh, kudos to, to Kevin and to Lisa. Uh, Craig Weber is amazing, uh, and special shout out to uh, Christine, um, uh, I'm going to get her last name wrong, uh, Saponara, uh, who really helped out on a lot of key projects. Um, and uh, uh, thumbs up on the uh, West LA counter that, that's coming. I really appreciate it. Um, just a couple things. I'm going to ask a couple questions about uh, homelessness and home sharing. But before I do, um, Mr. Koretz has asked me to uh, ask for a report back. Um, Mr. Koretz would like a report back on the um, potential of hiring a city biologist and a planner dedicated to planning policy issues uh, regarding uh, policy the council approved in the past year, including wildlife corridors, bridge line ordinance, and his upcoming uh, biodiversity motion. Absolutely. Um, so, um, and you know, I was cool with your budget until Mr. Uh, Krikorian <laughs> inadvertently set me off on 
uh, induced demand uh, with his analogy about uh, adding lanes on the, the highway, because now I'm afraid by giving you these resources, I'll just get more development in my district. So I need to vote against this budget. You set me off there. Uh, so let me ask a couple questions about homelessness. Um, the, the policy planning housing, housing unit has been working on a number of housing and affordable housing related initiatives over the past year. Thank you. Um, the unapproved uh, dwelling ordinance, uh, that's, that's good. Accessory dwelling unit, um, linkage fee ordinance, which we hope will get approved. Um, transit oriented communities guidelines under JJJ. Uh, I know that's been released and coming to CPC in a month or two. Uh, and then uh, the home sharing ordinance and the permanent supportive housing ordinance. Um, I understand there's a development services housing unit with positions that were approved in 2016 17 that provide expertise in housing development and provide case management services for projects with affordable housing. So uh, what I'm wondering is, uh, is, is that unit actively working to address the need for more production of affordable and homeless housing? Well, it, but thank you, uh, Councilmember Bond. I appreciate that your comments. And um, well, we have we're dealing with um, how, housing and homelessness in two different areas. One of them is in policy, so we have planners dedicated to policy, and then we have planners who are on the project side of thing at our Development Services Center, and who deal with um, helping get the permits for for pro development projects that don't dedicate a certain amount to affordable housing as part of this deed restricted. So we do that in two different manners. So in terms of looking at the policies of housing and homelessness, that's on, that in essence is in our policy shop. And we'll be do, we're doing that in several ways. I mean, one of them is going to be, you know, we're, we're looking at updating our citywide general plan. Um, now we have a housing element as part of that, which is very, has very specific um, technical requirements under state law, and that does deal with housing supply and homelessness. But there is an overall vision for the city that 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 incorporates where we need to go from a from a housing standpoint. So we'll be we'll be updating that, um, and we so that will be happening in the next few years. Um, and as part of our community plans, we plan on incorporating that into the community plans. And as we go along, we have policy. The policy team is still dedicated to housing. That's going to be looking at um, more short-term interventions that we can do to really help with that. Now we are also looking at um, a, a specific initiative for the homelessness to, for for um, to aid um, permanent supportive housing. So we have an ordinance that that we're um, looking that we're developing. Um, that would really facilitate some of the, the approvals for some of the projects that are probably going to be funded with HHH and, and Mr. Keller can maybe get a little bit more into the details on that one. Can we still expect a draft in June? Yes. <laughs> He's, that was a nod. Uh, <laughs> I have a question about the, uh, the homeless policy items and I want to be clear we have two divisions in the the homeless, uh, the housing units. We have the policy, the general funded positions, which there are two that are working on a lot of the homeless issues, the safe parking, the permanent supportive housing. Then we have the other positions, which are at our development service center. Those are cost recovery, and those help expedite the projects that do include mixed income, because we want to really deliver the affordable housing that way. The, uh, the two things we have been working on, and we'd be happy to kind of uh, report back informally or formally, are the idea of, of safe parking, both on the public streets and on the private lots. Um, we are meeting almost every week or every other week on that. Every time we get somewhere, I think we've committed to getting there, but every time we get somewhere, there are additional challenges. We want to make sure we can have a defendable ordinance, but we are working on that. I don't have a timeline on that for you at this time. On the permanent supportive housing, we do have um, some draft materials available. I think right now we're looking at uh, the level and extent of what type of lift the city would like to do and what kind of process is the resulting. The bigger the lift the city does on the overall city, the easier it is for the projects to come forward, but there's some, um, some striking a balance on that as well. So we would like to deliver a uh, permanent supportive housing ordinance that if a project meets these criteria and includes the types of things that really the whole city needs, and I think, I think we heard earlier today that you know, the homeless discussion, uh, we want to create a, a clear path for that. So we're doing that balance now. I think we can um, kind of report back where we are, but we will have a, a, some draft options to share in June, and we're happy to do that. And um, by the end of next week on the safe parking, it'll be fine. <laughs> I just wanted to really commit that um, we did commit to finding a way through this, and um, it, it is truly a, a difficult task, but we are close to some options, and I know we had a meeting last week, and we're eager to report back to your team and a couple of the other council members' teams on where we are on that. Equally Next eager. Week. 
Um, the housing unit resources, those are sufficient to, to do this stuff? I know I did a, a motion to help you with some grant funding and stuff. Yes, and, and Lisa Weber has a few updates in terms of our signups at the Development Services Center. Sure, so last, last year we created our Development Services Center Deep Counter, and our dedicated housing unit is a big component of that. Last year we launched a program called the PHP, the Priority Housing Project Program, which was consistent with uh, the Mayor's Executive Directive 13 uh, to give specialized pre-application service and hand-holding through the entitlement process for projects providing at least 20% affordable for rental projects, 30% affordable for for sale projects. It's been a wildly popular service, and we're not just limiting it to affordable housing uh, projects where anybody with a housing component to their project can use the services of our DSC Deep Counter, our housing unit there. So we're basically asking to double uh, our team from, from two full-time persons to four uh, persons uh, because of the high demand and uh, the, the positive feedback that we're receiving. Uh, a lot of the work, too, that they do isn't just on the pre-application side. Uh, they do a lot of heavy lifting at the tail end of the process right before uh, building permits are issued to help with covenants and, and clearing uh, conditions and coordination with the other agencies such as HCID. So we've been very excited about this program and like to see it expand. Okay, thanks. Uh, just a couple questions about home sharing. Um, what what uh, funding sources is the department going to need in order to implement the ordinance as proposed, assuming as proposed is what we get? And, and I think the request that we've asked for is around a little under, around a million dollars that has to do with setting up the um, how home sharing is going to work is it's it's a in essence a registration right right and so we have to really set up the registration process and procedures and we have to do that online to really get the the, the amount of um, compliance that we had hoped for on there so I think we're looking at the setup around it, around a million dollars is what we're looking at in terms of the setup I think which has been incorporated into um, the budget request is my memory you want to that's in the budget or that's something you're asking for supplemental well, it's, And is in the UB. Um, however, um, the policy decision would have a corresponding fee for the registration right. fee or any enforcement fee that is tied to the program. So right. the expectation is that it would be full cost recovery and it would not be a general fund burden. Right. And we'd need to specify that in the ordinance that it, right. that it was funded by uh, uh, TOT. Right. There, there the would fee. be some new fee that would be corresponding right. that would go into the department's fee schedule. Right. Um, how long, uh, Kevin, do you think it would take, or uh, Vince, do you think it would take the registration system uh, to be up and running once the contract with a third party consultant signed? Do we have a time frame? I don't know that we have a time frame yet in terms of how long it's going to take. Part of it's going to be we have to see what the ultimate ordinance is going to look like yep. um, because there's been a lot of variations of it as it's gone through the process. In fact, there's been even more as has as, as left the uh, City Planning Commission. So, so we're going to have to take a look at what the um, ultimate ordinance looks like so that's why we're and again we're doing a fee for service for it so that's why we have to see what that looks like to, to kind of really calibrate what the fee is going to be but I think that as it goes through the process and the City Council gives us the the okay we can start working on that when we bring it back to you for your form and legality okay and the goal of course is fully online registration right yes yes okay uh, and uh, what kind of staffing do you think the department's going to need to process the registration applications and how soon do you think we would need it I think we'd have to evaluate that when we bring back um, the fee itself. I think what, when we do the fee, we're going to be looking at what it's going to take to actually establish the system, then what it's going to take to do um, the process there's, to um, implement. I mean, there's going to be a cost in the city planning part of it to actually be um, reviewing, if you will, um, processing the applications. Then there will ultimately there will be a code enforcement, um, you know, impact as when we have to be looking at trying to gain compliance with this. So we'll be evaluating both of those as we, as we prepare the fee itself. Okay. And in the, the uh, current budget as proposed, we're good for the resources that we need to meet our commitments to the California Coastal Commission regarding the LCP process? Yes. And that's up and running. Um, and it's been going forward, and we've been having several meetings on that. Good. Glad to hear. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you very guys. much. Ms. Martinez. Questions that were already asked on HPOZ, but I did want to report back um, to discuss on to discuss the right sizing for the historic resource um, staff. 
of what it would take, what are the costs, and what are the benefits. Okay, and then, Mr. Chair, um, this issue this issue isn't in the planning budget, um, but I want I do want to address the issue of the transient occupancy tax revenue being booked due to the short term rentals, and the money being counted on as revenue hasn't considered we haven't considered what our own policy is going to look like. So I will I just want to I do not want our budget item this budget item to determine how our policy um, our policy direction. So I'm actually looking for a report back that comes back with the potential revenue modifications with the different levels of policy changes that the council could come back with. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bertoni. Thank you very much for the great progress that planning is making uh, onward and upward. Thank you to your whole team and uh, thank you for your patience as well. So that brings up uh, building and safety next. Mr. Bush, welcome. It is, it is. And thank you again for your patience, but believe it or not, we're actually ahead of schedule, so. Uh, <laughs> that's, good, that's good to hear. You save the appreciate best, your. Save the best for last. Yes, year, indeed, guess, so. indeed. Appreciate oh. your extending <laughs> the work week a little bit. Um, we have your uh, letters, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but feel free to go ahead and open up, and then we'll get right into questions. Okay, thank you for the opportunity uh, again to be here. Um, as you mentioned, you did receive the letter. Um, we thank the mayor and, and the council for being supportive of our budgets uh, this year and over the last few years. Um, it's helped uh, the success of the department and to operate. Uh, our letter explains uh, everything in it that uh, we are um, uh, happy and uh, with the mayor's proposal on there. There are a few items that are in the letter um, that we have added in there, um, and we're here to answer any questions about it. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, we will start with Ms. Martinez. Yeah, I have a clarification. The budget deleted a position in building and safety in, in your budget that is currently is a staff position, it seems um, that it's an important position within your department. I think it involves a parcel, a parcel map. This person deals with parcel map issues. So I just want to make sure yeah. that, was that done on purpose or was that a mistake? Well, I'm, I think it was a, a mistake, an okay. error, because we were expecting it to be there. Um, I think it's there. a structural, is it, it, is it the, the structural engineer associate for? Four, yeah. yeah, and it does all the subdivisions and mm -hmm. works on the subdivisions, advisory with city planning. Um, and conducts a lot of hearings. Does a lot, it's a very, very beneficial to the development process uh, right now. So we were wanting to, uh, that to be restored. That's one of the okay. in the requests in the letter. Great. And I know that some of us um, on the city council have asked um, for you to look into a proposed reform on how do we deal with liens. With um, what? How do we deal with liens, mm -hmm. um, especially around, you know, sometimes these folks come to, to, to our meetings and they're incredibly frantic and afraid. And I think we've asked for your department to come back with some possible re ideas on how to reform that process. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that? Yes, we um, have been working hard. We, 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 in Building and Safety, we took a look at our operation and we've made some changes uh, that would affect that. Also, an ordinance was passed not too long ago that allowed us to send out a preliminary lien notice, mm -hmm. so get their attention ahead of time. Uh, part of the what's being worked on now, the ordinance um, that's being worked on now, would take the public hearing to the Board of Building and Safety Commissioners. So the quicker that we can get that going and get that in operation, mm -hmm. the public hearing will happen if we need to at Building and Safety Commission. We're also hoping that uh, the changes that we've made in the preliminary lien notice uh, notifications will help to uh, even decrease the amount of uh, lien notices that we have in there. And that's what you know one of the positions is in there as well. Okay, great, I'm glad to hear that because that. by the time people get here, People are incredibly, anxiety is high, people are confused, and we just need to expedite this a lot quicker and, and try to bring some um, 
normality to our process. So I appreciate that. Um, I actually want to get a report back on um, funding available to make this administrative clerk position available in the budget to assist with the commission as well. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Bush, for all the great work that you do. I appreciate you being the only general manager to live in the third district is oh. a great <laughs> distinction. Um, but also, aside from that, you also do great work. Uh, the structural engineer associate that we were just referring to, very important position. I'm glad it's in the letter and we're, I certainly want to help support getting that. But question to you is where's that person going to be located? Um, I would ideally want this person to be in Van Nuys, not just in Fig Plaza, or at least available to, to Valley mm -hmm. folks. Well, the position right now is uh, primarily in Fig Plaza, but as needed, it can go to the Valley at any time. Uh, so we can make appointments there and schedule it as needed. That's not a problem. Okay. Um, it's part of my continual push to always try to get, get more uh, services out in the Valley. Right. Uh, when ordinances are being considered, like the recent ordinance that passed for the R1 variation zones, applicants often rely on advice from building and safety counter staff when making decisions. Bringing this up, you know, recently with the, um, some of the, the R1 variation stone uh, plans, there were folks who made plans, but based on talking to the counter staff, but then the ordinance changed and they were kind of left high and dry and they were frustrated and we heard from them in my district. So the question is, um, how do we how do we deal with that in terms of training the staff to be aware of potential upcoming changes and to be able to, to communicate that? Are we um, communicating that to the line staff so that they're able to not just tell them what is but what may be immediately pending? Yeah, as soon as those changes are made, we do training fairly quickly on it. And we're also willing to assist the customer because they may have been there when the code said one thing, and that's like you mentioned, that's right. they did the plans that way, and then the changes make, they come back in, we say you have to make these changes because this, this happened. And our staff will work with anybody and help explain it. And uh, we do our best to make sure that our staff is prepared and has all the details. Yeah, like in this particular case, they were doing a single family home pre the pre R1 variation zones, but but nobody told, you know, nobody told them if they had maybe gotten a vested interest or, you know, something they, they could have preserved. And said, instead, they spent a lot of money on plans and then they come back. Yeah. I, I think one of the problems with that initially was that we got hit with it as a surprise, I think, as we all did because of the lawsuit. And it made the, you know, the changes go into effect and everything was put on hold. That really created a, a problem for everybody. And we tried our best to contact everybody and, and make them aware of what was possibly coming. Uh, and let you know let them know and uh, we work with a lot of people to try to get that resolved So if you're aware of any particular that are having an issue We'll be happy to, to help Great. if you just let us know and the concierge service program staff Do they know about all the ordinances that are on, on the horizon? Yes, they do. Okay um, The new build LA web system when when will that be available? Um, Obviously, that's going to be extremely helpful with assisting people in the project. Yeah, the electronic plan check portion of that is getting ready to be implemented in the real near future, that portion. And so building and safety will be using that and some other, uh, other departments will be using that so the plans can be submitted and they can all be seen electronically on there. And uh, the other phases of, the, of Build LA um, as they're developed will be implemented. And I don't have an exact timeline, you know, at this time. As a, is there a when ballpark? Schedule or well, is that something? It's for the electronic plan check. Uh, that's going to be happening is in, the next in, next couple, couple, in the next couple in the next couple of weeks. I think. But but in terms of the whole web-based system, is there a, is there a timeline or, or is that something you want to report back on in terms of a, a upcoming schedule? Pardon. Yeah. Um, the, the portal is still at least six to twelve months out. Um, DBS is currently creating the portal, and then once the portal is actually up and running, they will start accepting e-plan applications through the portal, and then existing proprietary systems within the other departments will interface with the portal. Um, the departments are currently working on 
identification for a universal customer identification number, as well as some of the other things that are gonna be necessary to actually link a project and follow a project as it moves from department to department. And then ultimately, once all of the systems are integrated, um, it'll basically follow through and people will be able to check status on a real-time basis. But we're still at least six to 12 months away from that. Okay, maybe it doesn't have to be a budget uh, report back, maybe a special report back in terms of the, the milestones that we need to hit and because I want to make sure that I'm being helpful. So I, I'm very excited about it. I want to make sure that we can see those milestones and figure out where we might as council be helpful to you in getting the resources or overcoming any roadblocks. But great, um, Thank great you that you're moving forward on. <laughs> um, last question. There was a reduction in the backlog of code enforcement cases from uh, 10,500 to 7,500. What's, what do you, what do you uh, attribute this decrease to? Was it an administrative completing paperwork or folks actually correcting or, and paying the fees? It was a, probably a combination of all of it, but one of the biggest things was the council and the mayor's office uh, restoring the, uh, the staff that was cut uh, beginning in uh, 08, 09 um, in the last, uh, last few years. So it's been very helpful to uh, get out, have the staff to get out to the complaints, also working with the, uh, the people. The code, the code violation inspection fees that are on there have been helpful. The, the warnings for the non-compliance fees are very helpful. Uh, people are complying a lot quicker when they, they see the fees that are coming if they don't comply. So it's, it's been helpful. Human nature, okay. Yes. Well, again, uh, that's it for my question, but thank you very much for, for the great work that you do and all, that all of you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonin. Uh, I'll be quick, I'm running out of steam. Uh, just a couple quick, uh, thanks for everything you guys do, you are also phenomenal. Um, uh, just a couple quick questions about enforcement. Uh, you know, it's the, the question I always get from constituents is, is, is about enforcement. And I'm wondering um, what, if anything, DBS is doing to increase inspectors for new construction and code enforcement, you know, are there any untapped possibilities for additional fee supported positions? Uh, we have been filling our new construction inspection positions. Um, we've had the vacancies. Uh, fortunately, we were able to work with the personnel department that we were able to get our uh, positions, our tests to be continual rather than creating a list for two years, it expires and then you have to go through that process. So we're having continual tests. So it's helped us uh, to fill the, get the positions filled. Um, so that's going to be that's going to definitely help um, with that as we're completing uh, filling those. It's also helped us too with people uh, retiring. We were able to fill them a lot quicker because we have mm -hmm. these lists already established. So that'll be helpful. Good. Yeah. Uh, are there any specific uh, staff resources dedicated for zoning and condition enforcement? Um, we have there's a, a program that was started, but it hasn't it's not funded at this point uh, hasn't you know gotten all completely on there There's staffing positions. It's going to deal with conditional uh, use beverage CUBs mm -hmm. um, And that's uh, it's on the books the positions are there. They're not funded at this time uh, as that uh, Program builds up and the fundings there. We will fill those positions. What, what, we'll why it. hasn't it been funded yet? You want to touch on that? Um, council member the the fee was just implemented um, in the current fiscal year mm -hmm. so planning can only impose that fee on um, projects and conditions as they come forward for renewal so existing conditions we can't retroactively charge the fee for so as the department is starting to charge the fee the fee is actually um, going into effect six months after for the initial inspection okay so basically building and safety is being reimbursed on an overtime basis and we're doing that through the FSR and the workload hasn't gotten to the point where we actually have to fill the full-time positions that are on the book but the funding will be there um, once we hit the workload requirements okay has the um, department ever thought about or explore the possibility of uh, adding an inspection fee to discretionary approvals in order to have automatic proactive inspections of permits that have conditions? Um, that, so, that's what this, this program is that uh -huh. we're talking about here. This fee um, is going to be attached to the, uh, the new CUBs. Mm -hmm. We're starting with the CUBs, as, and it'll expand later once we, we get the bugs worked out of it. Okay. Uh, and that fee is going to pay for proactive inspections. Okay, good. I'm, I'm eager to see it expand beyond the... Yeah. The, the CUBs. And, and I'll let you know, too, is that um, 
the our complaint we still respond to complaints about CUBs and CUPs yeah um, and fortunately with the increased staffing in the last few years we've been able to uh, get out to them a lot quicker now uh, so which has been pretty good okay so great. much better and uh, I don't imagine you have this at your fingertips but any idea how many enforcement officers are currently in assigned to uh, the west side or the CD 11 area uh, you have um, I believe there's three inspectors and a supervisor in your district. Uh, that was part of the restoration in the last, uh, you know, over this is that we went down to about a half of a supervisor and maybe one or one and a half right. inspectors in every district. But it's all, uh, it's pretty close to having at least three inspectors and a supervisor in the areas. Now. And that's three real people, not, not three, counting any vacancies that's, or that's stuff like three, that? That's three bodies that are working. Okay. Uh, is, is, is that enough? I mean, I, I know sometimes it might be hard to get a, a full day's work in because you're likely to spend a, a, a half of it in gridlock. Uh, do you need more to actually be as pro productive as you would be in another part of the city yes yeah, so, you know we had a proposal to add more again in the budget this year um, and I think if we if we're able to do that um, there's an allotment that is in here yep. uh, for some funding for the code enforcement uh, we'll be able to uh, add a few more positions maybe after the first of the year so we'll, we'll look at doing that uh, and then there was you know there's possibility maybe next year if we can you know get budget uh, approved you know is available we will uh, ask for some more staff again to uh, increase the staff in there so we can get the all the times and the caseloads down okay and response times thank you very much okay thank you all thank you all right um, just a couple of things uh, mr. Bush uh, on the concierge services program uh, the proposed budget requests new funding and six new positions um, for the new citywide business case management program and, and I want to kind of get a better understanding of how that would interface with uh, the mayor's office of economic development who's it, doing what in that process okay so the mayors the have the business teams that are citywide and I believe there's nine centers nine business center centers and uh, they've been dealing with 20 20, 12,000 calls that they've been getting about people that want to open businesses here in the city. And they have found that there are quite a few that need further assistance with the permitting process and that they would need a, like a case management system. So that's what these six positions are for. They are going to, as they, they're going to be filtering the calls and, and they're, so we're looking at taking the customer and walking them through the process, getting their permits, they, their building permits on the building permit side, walking them through any, uh, any of the planning conditions, whatever may happen to help them to get the permit issued so they can get up and operating. Okay, so yeah. essentially uh, building and safety is offering the technical and permitting side of the mayor's office to help these selected businesses yes. that come through. There's okay. only so much they could do, and that they were really seeing that this was a benefit, would be so, a benefit to it. Well, it absolutely is a benefit. In yeah. fact, this is one of the things that was anticipated in the comprehensive jobs creation strategy to, that would involve the business advancement team mm -hmm. as well, which will be housed um, in economic development uh, as well. So uh, I think. W Mr. Englander had a suggestion, and, and I join in it, uh, that we'd like to understand, maybe get a report back as to um, whether the work of the uh, concierge services program would be limited to the mayor's office of uh, economic uh, development referrals, or would it be appropriate as well to include council office referrals when we have the same sorts of challenges of businesses that come to us and need that extra help? So um, I'd like to um, have that. I, I think the answer to that question is that yes, we, this team could you know uh, meet those needs as well. Great. Well, that's there's no that question. May, that may save us a report back yeah. as long as this funding of these positions is adequate in order to do that. Yes. And there's no policy assumption in our approving this that that it would be limited to the mayor's office no it's it's limited to bringing the, the jobs and the business here and so anybody that comes in here and if it comes from the council office or the mayor's office we will definitely act on it great and this team will be specially for that great thank you and then uh, mr englander also asks for a report back on 
all of the department's requests for 100% fee supported uh, positions, uh, which um, I would join in as well. Now the, um, the existing building energy and water efficiency program, uh, there's a proposal for six positions to support that program. Will those be uh, penalty funded? Will those, will those positions be funded by uh, penalties for violations or for fee funded? How will that work? What, can I, uh, one thing real quick. Sure. I neglected to introduce that when we sat down at the table in such a hurry. Osama Yunan is the executive officer and I think everybody knows Stephen Ghali is uh, our uh, chief of our resource management bureau and Anna Mae Yutan is our, uh, our uh, chief uh, management analyst. So go ahead, Osama. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, uh, Councilman. Th there is a fee associated with that program. So these positions are mainly funded through the fees that the uh, customers pay. Okay. Do you expect that that will be a full cost kind of fee? That is correct. Okay. Very good. Now, on the um, intermittent code enforcement services and uh, uh, the proposed budget has a uh, benchmark of 7,500 cases as the backlog. Um, what does that mean in terms of response time? What does 7,500 case backlog mean? Well, that's the open cases. So um, that's, you know, they're all different timelines and that are on there. We deal with the, uh, we, you know, we haven't prioritized from our number one complaints, which are, uh, you know, any emergency type situations. Uh, our complaint, our response time to the complaints, um, we've been trying to get out there and it's increased quite a bit. Uh, we've been trying to hit the 70% within 10 days, um, which is, is much better. Um, of course, our customers would like to see it even faster, but uh, that's a lot better than the 28 days that we were at when we were uh, during the uh, economy downturn and the staff was cut. Uh, so the caseload, the, the open cases, we were over 10,000. We've been working hard on getting those down and that's for doing, to do follow-up inspections on them to find out if they're in compliance. And if they're not, then we move it along to the next uh, form of process in there. But the 75 we're talking about are open cases, okay. actual orders on them. So what would be the outside, uh, li the outer limits of closure of, of those cases? In I'm trying to, to quantify in terms of, of closure time when you have a backlog of 7,500 compared to 2,500 mm -hmm. or 10,000. Do you have, is there any way that you can quantify that? Well, the, the cases would typically in order will have 30 days on it. It, it could be less time if we, we need be, but um, what that the case stays open there and what happens, the reason that the cases, we get more and more cases on there is a case may come up that's a little more severe than the other cases. So we're gonna get on that one sure. first. And then as, as we get back onto them, the more staff there are to do the follow-up inspections on them, uh, the smaller the amount of uh, open cases that we'll have. We can close them, get them moving up, okay. moving forward. Okay. Um, I don't have anything else. Uh, anything else for building safety members? I, I just need to say how um, pleased I am with the incredible progress that this department has made in the time that I've been here uh, under Ray and then under yourself. It's, it's just been... Um, it's really been a breath of fresh air and the, uh, the responsiveness that you've shown not only to our offices but to the business community as well. Um, it's really been a contributor, a great contributor to the economic recovery of the city and, and uh, huge uh, shot in the arm to job creation as well and uh, I want to thank you and your team for that. Thank you and we appreciate the support that we get from the council. Great. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Uh, and members, uh, that brings us uh, to the end of today's business. It is 625, so the record remains intact. Um, and we started quite late, and so excellent work, excellent work, members, in getting through a, a full agenda. So Monday morning we'll be starting at 9 a.m., and uh, although there may be some variation in this, uh, in this schedule, we are currently set to consider the city clerk, convention and tourism development, general services, ITA, animal services, cultural affairs, El Pueblo, uh, DOT, uh, and the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. 
um, there might be some variation that we'll see, but um, remember members that that is also May 1st and there will be street closures and uh, challenges in getting in and out of City Hall. So um, uh, to keep that in mind because we would like to get started at 9 so we can also get you out as well. And with that, if there's nothing else, uh, until Monday morning, we are in recess. Have a great weekend.